I'd really like to know what inspired that spirit of bravery within all of you. And where did you get to the point of mind and consciousness? I know, Mama, you say later on in your you know, you were involved first. It's like politics took you on and then consciousness came later. The spirit of, um, of, of, of being brave and fighting for your people. So what inspired that within you? And where do you get to the point where you say, my life means nothing compared to this bigger ambition and this desire and will for freedom for our people and for power for our people? Yeah, so yeah, that's my own contribution. Thank you so much, Aya. Um, before you answer that question, Mama, um, I, I would have wanted to raise it, you know, maybe couch it within the energy of youth, because a lot of us do some of the crazy um, when we are younger, and crazy only reflectively when you look at them, you're like, yo, did I really do? I wanted to perhaps marry that question with the, the idea of youth, you know, that's that you. The, the spirit of youth, and we don't talk a lot about that. And space, I think, in the revolution, we are not able to, you know, see what it really means to be a young person putting your life in the line like that. And um, maybe, Mama, you can start, and then Mama and certainly by Mama coaching at the. Do, do you want me to start by asking yes, that question? Yes, yes, please. Hmm. <laughs> ah, you know, I just think the different, the, I think the challenges were the same with the um, fees must fall. Us, hey, oh. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, I'm just saying the challenge was actually similar because you were challenging not only the status quo about your fees, but challenge, child, also challenging injustice at that time. But with us, Aya, Nabo Mahauta, we had a gigantic challenge like David and Goliath. We were challenging a system, a system which was brutal, a system which was racist, a system which was unjust. And one thing which I can say made us say, this is enough, is because we were living this poverty. We were experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. And at the point when we we're rising up against Goliath, to be very honest, it's, it's, it, it, it was, I think, it, it, it was a divine thing, you know, which was propelling us. And more so, because we were young. You know, looking at the fees must fall when it was happening now, sitting at the age at which I was sitting, I looked at you. Because you become so brave, you become so courageous, you don't see anything else. And then I'll sit and you can see me think they are actually saying forgive. You know, the fees, the students, the fees must fall. They remind Never pants by a figure about Pagamis and Danam, but me, but yeah. And speaking of spirit, sorry, Mama, uh, I was going to ask you specifically. You speak that at the end of that trance state, that dream state, that you felt strong, powerful, and murderous. What happened to that spirit of 
being murderous, that murderous spirit in you, that powerful spirit, did it manifest into other things or did it leave your body when you left the trance? Well, um, like I said, I, I, I had um, the victory. You know, when I looked at them, I thought these are not untouchable like they think. Yeah. So, and, and I was going through that because remember I stood for 24 days. So the 18 days when I was standing and, and I'm telling myself, I'm going to stand there until I die, but I will not do what they do because they give you a notebook. They say, write about your life. And then I, I was now at the point where I was writing like two, two lines because I have nothing to tell them and I'm not going to write what they dictate. So that spirit stays on. And I want to come to the, your question about the youth. I, you know, as I'm now writing about my story, as I'm writing my story, I, I, when I look at my life, how even me getting into SARS in the black consciousness was not a coincidence. I always look at the way I was brought up. Uh, I, I, I was quoting something when, when I was in primary school, we had this teacher who would say, why are you wake, walking like this? Because if you walk and you are not showing courage, a white man will just push you aside. And this is your land. Mm -hmm. So he was saying, if we can't do it, we must hold ourselves like this, you know? And when Fairwood died, I don't know, I was in standard three or what, and we listened to, to Radio Bandu. They say, hey, the prime minister in Sutu has died and what, what, we must all wear black. So when we went to school, we took out, I remember I took out the white shirt and I was wearing, wearing my dangari and I took my mother's pen, uh, uh, church pantyhose so that I must be black. When we arrived at school, the teachers were saying, why are you people wearing black? We said, no, uh, because the radio said, they say, go back home and change because this person who has, who has died is your torture. They send us all back home. I couldn't even tell my father that I had done that. Because the language at home, my father was saying he's, he's not talking politics, but the things that he used to say here yeah, about white people, about being, you know, those things, they really woke us up. So those things, my experience starts from there. Also that then my father, I don't know, it was 1963 when, when the police took him. Before John Foster Square, there was Marshall Square. And they took him, he had just got an operation and they took him, they beat him up, the operation opened up and then he went back to hospital. When he came back, they took him again and then they put him under house arrest. You know, that growing up. And then at school, when I arrived at Morris Isaacson, it was also a school of activism. And maybe to correct something, Tiro didn't teach state machining. My Tiro taught us when he was expelled at, at university. So I'm also a product of Tiro. So you can imagine all that. And Sasso during their winter schools, they used to show us these films where the, the, the uh, uh, blacks are tortured in the field by whites. And you can imagine what those films do to you, where you see people being hanged uh, over fire. I used to say they are being bri bribed, you know? then you get so angry every time you see a white person. And that is how I grew up. Thank you, Ma. Perhaps so could hear from Ma Kojela. I, I just want to add to what you said, Mahauta, about the, uh, when Fairfoot died and what they told you to do at school. I remember when I was at school, I probably was also around about standard three or so. And they told us that when we stand at assembly and to sing uh, the anthem, we were not to even, even if a fly sat in your nose, we were not to move. <laughs> so it just brings back that memory for me of, of that incident. Um, Makhauta, before I, uh, I, I had a chance to tell my story, me, you and Kogila, we have the same thing about uh, the death of Hendrik Fairwood. Um, you know, I was going to say, in fact, I'm still saying, my mother, my mother, my uneducated mother, who could not even read and write whenever she wanted to read the Bible in the evening, 
I was at primary, we had to read for her. My mother was an unsung hero of the struggle. And I think at that age, I was very young uh, because I, 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 they sent me to Lesotho at the age of 13. My mother, when Fervut died, you know, I was coming from school. I don't remember whether, because we used to wear black uh, gym dresses. Maybe we didn't have to wear any black. We went to school like that. But I remember my mother who used to sew, you know, some dresses to sell so that we could, she could generate some income. When I opened the gate, I used to live in Shabville, in a four roomed house. And when I opened the gate, my mother just dashed out of the house. She was still actually holding on to this, uh, whatever she was sewing. And she got, and she held me. And she said to me, Mtanami, you know, and I just got frightened. And she says, That's what my mother said. And she said, she kept on jumping at it. And she was holding and, and staring at me. At she, That's what my mother said. And I tell you that time, I was, I think I was about, you know, it was 1958, when he died, somewhere there. And, but my mother instilled black consciousness in me, and Aweli. And I remember, when I look back, I remember her. And then when I got into the house, she said, is this Omamel? Mamel, I'm telling Mamel, radio. At least she had a radio. And the music, you know, it was this somber music when a person had died. And my mother kept on saying, Mamel, I'm telling Ha, if he inja. She actually said, if he inja. And yeah, okay. And another instance where I see my father was very introverted, but I remember at the age of about 10, walking with my dad in Shavil Ferienachen, which was called predominantly a white Africana Dorpi. And we're working, my father in my, in my family was a symbol of authority, a dignified man. Papa, you know, if you met him, Sega Smart Ahamba Metropin, he would be so elegantly dressed with his hat and his suit. But that, that, that I'm saying, when I observe that, for me, it was saying, we are oppressed by white people. We are oppressed by white people. What happened that we're walking straight? When we were walking, when I grew up in Shavu, if you're a black man, you could only walk on those pavements if there was no white person coming your way. Whether it's a young boy or what. And I remember walking with my father on that pavement. My father was smartly dressed and holding an umbrella. And we saw two teenagers like they were coming from school. And as they were walking towards us, they were speaking Africans, they were daring my father to get, they actually said, I, I many Africans, get off the pavement, you, 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 you kefa. And my father was, and I could feel his hand tightening and he was walking straight. And they kept on saying, Gaffer, walk off, you know, like get off the pavement. My father was walking straight against them. And then, when they were near, the only thing they could do was to push him. And as they pushed him off the pavement, you know, he, he lost his, his balance a little bit. And the umbrella which he was holding, we were holding an umbrella, it flew over. When it flew over, my, and that time, you know, when I was, I was saying in my heart, Baba, Suga, let's get off the pavement. You know, I was saying that in my heart. And as the, his umbrella flew off, my father turned and he looked at these young boys and he said, and then he went and picked up his umbrella and he held my hand and we walked on. You know, those things for me, they were gradually teaching me about inequalities, about injustice, that me and my father, my father, Ubaba Wam, we, my, my father was reduced to this indignity walking with his child. I'll never forget that. And I'll never forget my mother telling, rejoicing about the death of Hendrik Fairwood. 
Wow. Yes. Um, that, that, and I find it strange that the three of us talk about Henry III. I think it's mm. about influence. Yeah. That yeah. We grew up. Yeah. So, Thank you, Mama. Um, those two very powerful moments of conscientization. Yeah, conscientization. Because we often think that, you know, you get conscientized when you read a text, but yeah. sometimes it is a lived yeah. you know, experience. Yeah. And that stays with that stage. beyond yeah. what the text uh, yeah. gives you. Perhaps you can take us through, yeah. you know, some of yeah, what you want story. to share with us. Yes, um, it, it's just a coincidence that I, I, I had to speak about this incident because Mahauda brought up Henrik Verwood and Kogilas brought up Henrik Verwood. Just as a preamble, um, you know, uh, you, we all know that the Bantu Education Act was um, enacted in 1953, and then it actually became effective January 1954. And before that, when I would ask Kogila, which school do you go to? I'm just making an example. I, me, I go to a, 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 a church, Anglican school, Roman Catholic school, Presbyterian. There were church schools when we were still under very good education. So when Fairwood was the minister of Bantu education, where they were telling the black nation what kind of education system we had. I was a student, a primary school student uh, at a church school and the Anglican priest I was a very bright student. Those days, you either came number one or number two. So when Father Voy's daughter became number one, I became number two. When, she, when I became number uh, one, she became number two. And Father Voy, being a graduate of Forte, you know, aware of situations, and like my parents were not educated at all. Um, he, he, when he decided, he decided next year, Unombuiselo is not going to be part of this Bantu education, which Henrik Fervut and his government. And then he decided to apply for his daughter at St. Agnes in Lesotho. So Father Voy, being aware that I was a very brilliant young student. I don't know, I was not even Anglican, I was Presbyterian. I remember when he came, I was play, playing a party, a strategy, you know, those teens. And I saw Father Voy, and I cried. I said, yo, what is Father Voy coming to do at my home? Ganti Father Voy was going to persuade my parents that I must go, then I was 12 years, I must go to running, you know, like running away from this Bantu education to a school called St. Agnes in Lesotho. So he came and he spoke to my parents and they were very worried that, Father Voy, how can we take a 13 year old to go to a school so far from home? And I went, I was posted in Lesotho at a school St. Agnes where we were under the British system of education. So my secondary school was uh, uh, under University of Cambridge. Away from this point of education, I landed at St. Michael's School in Swaziland. And it was in Swaziland uh, that because many of us, many students from the Republic were now in some of us went to Swaziland, some of us went to Lesotho, that when I, when I completed my A-levels and O-levels, I was, because United Nations, being aware of the apprenticeship, they used to give students from South Africa a scholarship to go and study overseas. And it became a turning point. At that time when I was passing my O-levels, and uh, especially my O-levels, the Swaziland government was becoming nationalistic. I used to call it, they were becoming jealous. They refused us yes. to get uh, uh, United Nations scholarships to go and study overseas. And they're still using travel documents because, because sometimes when we went to, to, to the Bantu Affairs officers to try and get um, I am going to this Swaziland, you must be here in South Africa. Sometimes just going to school in Swaziland, we had to, to be taken and, and, and go underneath what, saying I'm a, I'm a fence. So just to cut a long story about Swaziland, 
they refused me for the scholarship USA and then I actually chosen to go to Denmark. And I remember how I cried when my sister fetched me. I, illiterate parents have, have made me escape Bantu education. And now I'm going to a Bantu education university. And because then, if I'm Zulu, I had to go to Zululand. If like Mahauta, was Musutu, you had to go to Teflop. If you're closer, you had to go to Forte. So I landed up at the University of Ongoye. And because in my dream, I wanted to do education. I wanted to do education, be a teacher. I didn't understand Africans. I said, yo, it's not me who, who's going to get there and be subjected to doing a degree with these Africans because my last time I did Africans was at primary. So I looked, I took the brochure and looked at anything which said ology, ology, ology. And I said, oh, this one social work, it's sociology, it's social work, it's anthropology. And I did that degree. That's how I chose my degree. And what is significant about my activism, when I look back now, I always praise God and my ancestors that when I landed at Unizul, it was though God prevented this scholarship, the UN scholarship, for me at the age of 22 to come back home and be involved in the struggle for liberation, which my parents made me unconsciously instilled in me the spirit of activism. I landed at the University of Zululand at a very, very appropriate time. When the students had broken the Steve Biggles and the Seth Coopers and the Strini Moodleys and whoever, Nengwe Kulus, they had just broken off from the National Union of South African Students, which was a, a mixture of black and white university students. When they were in, 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 at Grahamstown, they got into a bosperat and it led to the foundation, the forming of Sasso at Teflop, 1969. So I landed there and I found University of Zululand. You know, I don't know, the feeling is just unbelievable. I, I, I felt, Daphne, you are back home. That's when I became an active uh, student, a student activist, and black consciousness was coming about. So I, I'm always thankful to God and my ancestors and the spirit of all the black people in South Africa that I was passing, I had to be, I was participating in a very unforgettable event in my history as a black South African child. And I became an activist and we formed SASO. We went about forming SASO. We are forever coming to medical school, this University of Natal, forming uh, strategies of SASO, talking about black consciousness. I was in it and we created, uh, I don't know, mm. we became very active, but I was also, because my sister then was working for the South State African Aidsai Corporacy, my sister was tortured, but because I was involved in SASO, and they, they said to her, she must persuade me not to be involved in black consciousness politics, otherwise she would lose a job. On the other side, I was called by the rector of the university into, into his office, telling me that if I don't stop this Sasso nonsense, I would be expelled from the school. And I remember, as Mahato was saying, when he called me into his oval office, I sat there. That's how daring and courageous and unfearing we were. He's, I got in there and he spoke to Africans. And of course, I didn't understand. I said, I said, I said, listen, 
uh, Mr. Fori or whatever. I said, I said, listen, Mr. Fori, if you want to talk to me, please stop talking that enemy's language. I said to him, I said, please stop talking this and let's speak to me in English. So that is the background. And another thing which led to me featuring in this book, Time to Remember, is that I want to pay tribute to Sam Modley, like I pay tribute to Mahauda, because Sam uh, approached every one of us, but um, she approached me because I worked with Sam in the Black community programs, and I agreed. But the thing about us writing the story in this book, it was so strenuous because we we were restricted. There are so many things which are I I hear. This is just the, the tip of the iceberg. Sam kept on saying, so I'm grateful to her that she made us write. And my story, you will read it, is called Footprints in the Sand. Don't, Those give, are my don't give it too much away. They must buy that book. And <laughs> Thank you yeah, so, that's, that's so the much, only Mama. background I can tell about my story. You'll read it, but yeah, we couldn't. It was a tip in the iceberg. There's a lot which we didn't write about. Thank you so much, Mama. Please give a round of applause. Very interesting moment how um, the activism, the black consciousness that is groomed from home meets you when you are at Unizulu and it just becomes one. I think that's quite powerful. Mam Kojila, we are now coming to you at Destiny Unchallenged. Can you please take us through to your chapter okay. I mean, in the book? And we'll also allow, I think, a few minutes to our sister. She's joining us online, right? Who would like to read a review of the book? Oh, she, you'll read it for us. Okay, great. So as soon as Mama finish, I'll just come back to you. Um, Sulani, I've not forgotten about you. Over to you, Mama. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, just before I start my story, I just got a brief... Uh, uh, I did a brief thing on the on the other writers who are not here, and sorry, <clears throat> so that you get an idea of this book, because uh, a lot as as uh, Daphne said, you know, it was it was a great thing that Sam got us together to to do these stories, and they are some real um, good stories here and interesting stories. So before I go on to mine, I'll just because they add to what. Um, Mahaute and Daphne had been through as well. Sorry, just bear with me. Um, in a time to remember, 30 women of the BC movement broke their silence and chose to speak truth to their endurance, resistance, and resilience. Endurance, resistance, and resilience are intertwined in response to the socioeconomic and political context in which the women were placed. Women faced banning orders, arrests, house arrest, arrests, death in prison, torture, incarceration, and were held in communicado in solitary confinement for lengthy periods. An example of what some women went through in our stories can be found in a letter to her grandchildren by Shaida Issel, who writes about what she had to endure. Those security policemen were so cruel, they made us undress. They enjoyed my embarrassment. They made us jump so high that they could see our most private parts. Yes, they beat us. Didn't care about us being women, they, but they never broke me. I survived. Her inner strength and resilience and the power within is illustrated when Shida with conviction uh, pronounces, the security police made us very strong. They helped me to get where I am, who I am, and it was because of the suffering we endured for long periods of time that we became stronger. I became stronger. They wanted to do the opposite, but it backfired. Anthony Punan's story of being still strong and centered she writes of her experience at the Pretoria police station. On entering the interrogation room, 
a man with the physique of a boxer lunged at me. His powerful fist landing straight in my face. He continued to beat me with his fists all in my face. Each time he hit me, I was swung around, first clockwise and then anti-clockwise, depending on which fist he used. Throughout the interrogation process, I had no agency or control over my body. The only aspect I could control was my mind and my spirit. I have lived my life consciously, resisting that, that which diminished my sense of self-dignity. Uh, within our stories are laid issues of political memory, and both Kogila and Gwen Makwape reminisce about the 25th of September, 1974. Uh, that's the Free Limo Rally. Um, this part is from uh, uh, Gwen's story. Banners decorated the entrance to Curry's Fountain in Durban. Viva Free Limo, Uhuru, Free Limo. Now, Zania when It was supposed to be a ce celebration of Mozambique's independence. Sasso and B BPC planned to show solidarity. The state banned the rally, but in the spirit of defiance, the rally went on. So both our stories reflect emotional pain and the struggle to survive in harsh, bitter political environment. Both of us faced financial challenges faced psychological warfare waged by the police through harassment and intimidation. And each of us fought back the system, surviving the onslaught in our own way while the partners were in prison, revealing once more the power within each of them in following the principles of being self-sufficient and self-reliant. Okay, so that was just a, a brief... Um, um, Thing about uh, the writers and it's all of these stories are in this book which is on sale um so shall i think i shall go on with my story yes um okay i'm just going to give you a brief background into um how i became an activist i had no plans of becoming an activist i didn't know anything about politics i didn't know anything that was around us uh, going on, you know, completely naive to everything that happened. Um, but my chance encounter led me to be in the company of university students and academics. Um, I met Asha Mudli uh, by accident. And she asked me to, if I would like to take part in a play. So I was just 14 years old and knew nothing about, I just thought a play, you know, it sounded very exciting and interesting to me. And I said, yes, without even thinking uh, twice about it, thinking that this is um, uh, something like, you know, the plays you do at school or they bring these plays to school. But when I joined TechOn, I, uh, that's, uh, I'll come to that Theatre Council of Natal, I was surprised to find that it was all very different. So um, yeah, so my chance encounter led me to be in the company of university students and academics. Resurrection, which is the name of the play that I, well, it wasn't a play, it was Corrie Purse, uh, was gonna take part in, was the turning point of my life. It was a, it was a play highlight, which highlighted the inequality, injustice and suffering of the disadvantaged and the plight of those living in impoverished areas. I was privileged to meet Steve Biko during one of our performances on tour. I did not know the importance of this man back then and how he would change my life. Prior to this, I was politically naive and unaware of the fact that we lived under discriminatory laws. Uh, prior to joining TechOn, that's the Theater Council of Natal, I was, as I said, politically unaware of, of all of, of the discrim discriminatory laws. I lived in an area called Warwick Avenue. Uh, now, some of you here might know this area. It's where DUT is today. And you know the, the building where the students live? The, uh, 
that that's the accommodation. That was the block of flats that I lived in. It was called Scala. And it was near Basrek. And this was a place that was very rough. It was one of the roughest uh, places around Durban. Um, and it was controlled by thugs who attacked innocent people coming home from work on their way to the bus rank. I did not realize then that many of the indignities we had to suffer and live under was as a result of the apartheid laws. We were coloreds and Indians living together in the same area, but, but attending separate schools for coloreds and for Indians. And we didn't question it. You know, we just went along with the system. Um, and there was a school right in our area, uh, like in the midst of us, it was a, a school for white boys only, a high school. And even that we didn't question because we were so conditioned to the apartheid system and what was shoved down our throats. All of these things didn't even, you know, make us think that something was not right. So we were experiencing the struggle already in this area because of the violence, you know, by the thugs. But but not realize, but we were not, but we hadn't realized that we were in the struggle. We were just accepting that our, our oppression as if that was the norm. But that soon changed for me. Performing in protest theater changed everything for me. It was my turning point. Performing in protest theater was my awakening and black consciousness helped me to, decolon to decolonize my mind at a very early stage in my life. It inspired me to stand up for my rights and dignity, not just for myself, but for our people as well. It was not an easy road. Now, it's important to remember that those were dangerous times. The 70s were dangerous. We're speaking truth to power and any utterance against the government could, could result in one being arrested, imprisoned or banned. You are literally putting your life and freedom on the line for fighting for human rights and your dignity. So performing protest theater under these conditions attracted the attention of the security police and we were under constant scrutiny. In fact, at one such performance in Lamontville, we were arrested after our performance at the venue, having the permit to uh, perform there. So the cops came along after the show was over, and it was it was uh, quite late in in the evening, maybe about ten o'clock, and um, it was a school day. So they came and picked all of us up, threw us into the van, and took us to the police station and were, you know, starting to dock at us. But fortunately for me, I was underage, so I got released, uh, you know, at, at some time that, that night. And, and my parents were not even aware of what was going on with me, that I was involved in all these kind of things. And you will read more about this in the book about... Uh, so, um, and I was just in grade 11 at the time. And my, as I said, my parents did not even know what, was, what I was involved in. And um, yeah, so, so that, that was, uh, you know, how we were always harassed by the police. By 1972, my political activism became more entrenched as I became more involved in black consciousness. I began to attend protest meetings and, rally, and rallies in solidarity I supported boycotts of places and venues that discriminated against patrons based on their race. As we lived within walking distance to movie houses in the city center, we had the privilege of choosing any movie house that we wanted to go to. Uh, but this wasn't the same for everybody. You know, um, only Indians were allowed. So in solidarity, we chose to take the bus and go to movie houses in the outlying areas where there was no discrimination. So that was all part of the, the our, you know, what we did towards 
boycotting and stuff. Little things. We did little things, but it meant a lot to us because we know we were doing things. Um, you know, we, we were not part of the system. We were just uh, doing things in solidarity. Um, so at the end of 1972, I became a member of the Black People's Convention, BPC, uh, further committing myself to the Black movement. To, sorry, to the uh, to Black consciousness movement. Uh, by by 19, uh, and then of course ca came the Free Limo Rally. So I'm just going to read a little bit about that. Or, sorry, I wrote it down somewhere and I don't. Yeah. Uh, so in, 1974, uh, a celebration of the Mozam uh, uh, Sasso and BPC planned to show solidarity with Frilimo over their victory. And this was a celebration of the Mozambique independence from the Portuguese military government of the time. Um, we got to the, um, to the grounds where the, the rally was supposed to to happen and and we were surrounded people were there and we were surrounded by the system and police with their dogs and and the next thing before the rally could start they just released those dogs on on the people and we all ran in different directions. We didn't know where we were running, but just to get away from that, from the dogs we ran. And the school that I spoke about, this Mansfield High, this white boys school, we, we scrambled up that hill. And, uh, you know, we, because, and that's where, uh, you know, the, they set the dogs on us. So after that, um, my fiance, fiance at that time was arrested. I didn't even know. They picked him up, put him in the police in the, in the police van. He was bitten by the police uh, by the police dogs, and uh, we all started looking for each other. And I had to go around to the police stations that night looking for him, only to discover that he is now being moved over to Pretoria Central. So uh, the, it, it, was a, it was a long process. We were looking for, uh, you know, our people who were picked up and they ended up going to, uh, they, they took them to Pretoria Central, as I said, and held them um, for, some of them were held in, in solitary confinement. Um, <clears throat> I had to leave my studies. I was in matric at the time. So I left. Okay, I'm not worried about school now. We're near exam time, but I just decided we're going to go over to Pretoria and, and see what was going, you know, see if we could get to see these people, but we couldn't. But there were, uh, uh, there were some detainees, like uh, Strini Mudley and Sats and uh, Tara Lakota, in Quenque, uh, well, there were 12 of them that were arrested and we were allowed to visit them uh, because they were charged. So the others were not charged and we couldn't. And so Rev was not uh, uh, charged and he was held in, um, in solitary confinement and I couldn't visit him. So the women, of the struggle, those of us who were left behind, because must know most of them, their husbands, their partners, they, you know, were all in prison. So we had to do something. And one of the ways that, that we were able to uh, contribute to the struggle was to go there to Pretoria and prepare meals for those detainees who were to be charged. Mm -hmm. And it meant a lot to them to get home cooked meals. Because mm -hmm. as you said, Mahauta, you spoke about the worms in the food, mm -hmm. right? 
And so they looked forward to, to this. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, they looked forward to these home-cooked meals and it, it did a lot for their morale. So we visited them. A lot of them, their, their families were far and wide, so they couldn't get uh, 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 you know, these meals and visits from them. So we, those of us who could manage to visit them, we visited, you know, we, we visited them and uh, helped them out with that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think saying that my time yeah. is running out. Okay, yeah, so, well, there's, um, there's a lot you, will, you can read in the book. Um, yeah, but uh, just, just to let you know that Black consciousness, the end of the day, really helped me as uh, along the way. During my working times, we, I had to, you know, where I had to stand up for myself because we worked with whites. And if you ever worked with whites, you'll know how hard it was. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Mama. A round of applause, please. Um, before I go to Fulani, let me give Comrade Sarge a moment to share a review from one of our comrades on the book. Thank you so much, Sandy. Uh, this is a review written by Betty Govenden, who is an integral part of our decoloniality school. She attended the first two. She is in Cape Town at the moment and really feeling like she's missing out, but she's been watching online all of the time. Betty wrote uh, a review on the book and, and she asked if I could please share it here. Um, a critical review looking back to see the future by Betty Govenden. Book review, Time to Remember, Reflections of Women from the Black Consciousness Movement by, compiled by Sam Moodley 2018 is what we have been waiting for for a while now. In this extended time of memory, since the first democratic elections in South Africa in 1994, we have had a wide variety of biographical and autobiographical accounts of living under apartheid in the extent that South Africa has been described as a recited society, in quote. Alongside the histories of the main male leaders and a few women of the BC movement, important and necessary as they are, it is good to especially read here the her stories of a broad spectrum of BC women, many of them told for the first time. While the collection taken together encapsulates the common collective ethos of the BC movement, at the same time, it is especially invaluable for the inflections it provides of the black consciousness movement in South Af Africa from a vantage point of women's experiences from the 1970s onwards. The engaging narratives show in particular that the cartography of struggle, sorry, in quotes, quote, cartography of struggle, unquote, for BC women is widespread in terms of both space and place. The stories collectively show the amazingly vast circuits of community life that the BC women comrades traverse, flattening and leveling the political landscape so that resistance can take different forms and strategies from bush colleges to tribal universities, to the factory floor, to the student organizations, to grassroots healthcare clinics, to alternative theater spaces, in uh, bracket Sam Woodley, to literally training centers, to graphic design classes, Lata Ravji, to church spaces like Figile Matiboko, Hester Joseph, to prison precincts, Tembi Ramokaba, to children's homes, Aruna Naika, to NGOs, Rueda Halim, foreign countries, Oshadi, Mangena, and so many, many more. Our comrades of yes, yesteryear were trailblazers in forging a decolonial aesthetics, which included drama, theater, poetry, and art. Trajectories of place span across the length and breadth of the country, from Krugersdorp to Turfluf, Soweto to Zululand, Lanasia to King, King Williamstown, Coxta to Inanda, Langa to Verulam, to name just a few locations mentioned in the narratives. While the BC movement was systematically sidelined, marginalized, and harassed by the powers that were, it is ab absolutely impressive to see in these stories the determined creation of an alternative parallel universe. Running through all the narratives is the brave and robust transgressive liberatory politics of identity that the BC movement in general developed, shaped, and induced. And it is heartening and it does 
it is heartening and instructive to see how the BC women owned this and fashioned it on their own feminist terms after initial hesitation and tentativeness as the narrative by the late Ashadi Mangana shows. The women in their different narratives show their refusal to be defined by the oppressor's knowledge, structures, mindset, and language. At the same time, while working in camaraderie with the BC male counterparts, these young combatants, as Paula Pechel in her foreword refers to the women, were asserting their identity and rights within the movement. Turning inwards and creating other centers of validation also means asserting an alternative ancestry and lineage that included the likes of Lumumba, Fanon, Cabral, Audre Lorde, Wangari Matai, and others. It is wonderful to see these inspiring luminaries naturally dotted across the women's nar narratives. In the collection, and in this expansive global network of implicit solidarity claimed against the claustrophobic apartheid regime, while we speak of decoloniality nowadays, the BC comrades were actually living, thinking, and breathing this in different ways decades, decades ago. It is important to note that the time to remember is not your run of the mill rendering of a history from below. The individual personal stories of women show the impact and cost of broad political choices played out on multiple fronts, on intimate family life, children, nuclear and extended families, still cast in a patriarchal mold and the trauma and burden of survival against so many odds, not least from the police state itself. And if the stories in this collection are stories of unimaginable, unimaginable resistance and resilience, they belie the fault lines, seen and unseen in different forms that the women refusing victimhood and claiming agency had to constantly contend with. And so while a time to remember goes a considerable way in breaking the silence, in official South African struggle history, variously configured, if not mythologized, as Lipolo Peko intimates in her foreword, embedded and congealed in them many more stories, unspeakable things unspoken, to use Toni Morrison's words. All in all, a time to remember not only goes a considerable way in continuing the work of the TRC, it also shows an implicit trust in the vindication of ethical and moral values enduring beyond the narrowly partisan and outside the ballot box. At the end of the day, and in brackets, the, and the narratives in time to remember implicitly remind us of this close brackets, the struggle is, <clears throat> quote, a bestow upon South Africa and the rest of the world, the greatest gift possible, a more human face, Aluta continua. Thank you so much, Betty, and sincere apologies if I mispronounced the names. Thank you, my sister. Thank you, Saj. Um, Comrade President, if you may, please. Um, thanks. Um, let me be a PC and say hey, one as any one nation. When I when I listen to the stories that you are telling, I you see this is a resilient movement. Uh, it's a very strong movement. Um, maybe what I would like to ask is, perhaps we have heard stories that um, one of the successes of the Black Consciousness Movement was that it always had layers of leadership. You know, if, if for instance, uh, I don't know how true it is, uh, that usually you would have a 48 period. If a comrade is arrested, uh, you'd anticipate that, for instance, the comrade can withstand for maybe 48 hours. And then as soon as that 40 hour, 48 hours collapses, uh, a new leadership would emerge, you know, because that's one of the strategies but what I'm more interested in is the resistant methods. How did you go about to, like as a political problem, I know that Mama mentioned it uh, briefly that you know we're reading books, but from an organizational standpoint, how were you able to do those things? And um, of course, I wouldn't say they are linked to the formation schools, but I'm sure they would be part and parcel of that. But also in that closed circuit of leaders of that particular generation, how did you manage uh, to do this, because I think we're talking with one comrade yesterday that uh, I think also with Steve Biko, he demonstrated the ability not to break. If we read the Toll Assassin, we learn that they, they actually dealt with Biko looking for information. 
So the ability that all of you guys are, are telling us is, is something very important, you know, because in our movements these days, we've got a lot of snitches and renegades, uh, but we can learn a lot from the methods that you guys used. And uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, the enemy of time is upon us. So maybe I'll just give final words to um, the younger activists, just to reflect on what Umama has shared, and then we'll close it. Um, Aya, maybe you could go first, and then Bali can come afterwards. Mm -hmm. Thanks. No, thank you so much, um, Bomama, for first of all, being brave enough to fight these struggles. Thank you so much for constantly, you know, revisiting these very difficult moments, whether through storytelling and being resilient as well in your struggle. You were not only resilient when you were young, you were resilient as time passed as well. So that's just, you know, for me, that's, you know, an incredible principle, incredible spirit. Um, that's, you know, that's that's becoming a lesson for my life as I listen to you all, because we have this idea that we think that when you're young, you're energetic, you're brave, you don't care. But you guys, I mean, Ninabo Mama, as you um, as you continue to live your lives, you didn't dispel, you know, um, the struggle and the spirit of black consciousness, but instead, you know, you continued it and you framed it in other parts of your life as well. So this point where you're recording your stories and you're sharing this important history with us. So thank you for this book. And thank you so much, Mama, for the documentary as well. These things are really important for us as young black women um, to know the potential and the power that we have, you know, and how far our dreams and our ambitions can go in terms of, you know, fighting for our people and rebuilding, reconstructing the world. So thank you so much for your beautiful work and your sacrifices as well. Thank you, Aya. Mbali, maybe um, you could also touch on, you know, how Black consciousness centers, you know, cultural expression and how that makes a revolution. I think um, it, it, how cultural expression becomes a vehicle for the revolution in your reflection. Um, thank you, Sasandi. Um, yeah, like uh, just to just to reflect on the entire conversation, I think um, just for someone who's interested in writing and is interested in stories of women, this is a very important discussion and the work that has been put out is very important considering that there has been, like Usi Sandy mentioned earlier, erasure around women's stories and remembering and just archiving that history. I'm also just reminded of the work we did last year when we commemorated Umam Zondeni Sobukwe. And one of the women that I was tasked to research about was Umam Deborah um, Machoba. And I was just taken aback that she were, had lived until 2014, but yet I was only starting to engage with her experiences then. And to have you have written this book and contributed to the documentary as well is an important expert because that's also how we consume and we learn about different things through artistic expressions, like Sister Sandy said, literature, film, um, theater, as you, um, um, Kogila was exposed to black consciousness because you were um, driven by the vehicle of art, driven by creating and, 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 and giving to the people. And I think these two contributions that documentary and the book are such a very important um, contribution to culture, contribution to art, because we will we're still continuing to consume and know about these stories and these stories should be in our community, in our schools. So thank you so much for also just writing from a, a position of power. Like Umam Memachota said earlier that oftentimes our stories are told from a spectacle view where people come from far and they want to learn and they want to take and give what they think is suitable, but having the stories being written from a subject point of view and not an object, a person who defines their history and who writes their story is very empowering for us young learners or people, young activists as well. So um, getting the story from not the house, but the, 
but but the the portal of power there is and also just to have you sitting here with us today is is such an honor and a, a beautiful um opportunity so thank you so much we are allowed to clap comrades even though <laughs> i want to cross over to ondo um i think there are two comments or questions and then Mama, you take them in combination with um, Comrade Lulani's question. So it will be the third. Gondo, are you still there? Gondo here. Uh, thank you, Zandi. Um, so I have the two questions. Can you hear me now? Go ahead. Um, I have two, um, not questions, comments rather, um, from Viv, um, who says okay. more stories Am are I told. The one or is it a bit low? Okay, Ngondo, just give us one second. I think my brother over there is sorting it out. China? You may go, Ngondo. Ngondo. Um, Viv, can you hear me now? Is it clear? Is it low? Hang on. Perhaps once uh, while they are sorting it out, Mum D, are you able to quickly respond to the question of how Shulani. the BC organized yeah. leadership? Yeah, you, you know, Shulani, um, one central thing about Sasso when we were students. We, we, the leadership, both Steve, Nabo says, Nabo Ban, they actually um, started what was called formation schools. Those formation schools were preparing us in many ways against the challenges which we're facing as Sasso students. One of them, it was educational. They would educate us about, uh, even from America, the Black Power Movement. You know, they were pumping us, the Franz Fanons, you know, uh, pumping us with information like that. And another thing, they would, we would talk about strategies of overcoming harassment by security policemen and, and all those things. And yeah, that was further conscientizing. Those formation schools in, in answering you were the key pillars of, I, I think they gave us this courage to challenge, to not being fearful, to, to move ahead against everything. So I, they, were, they were excellent. We used to look forward to going to, yeah. to those formation schools. Can I just say one story? You know, one time in the formation school, you, you know, like they, they would also teach us how to pick out I'm a sellout and people were inf infiltrating Sasso. One time we were sitting, we were young, yes, if you learn. and can you imagine sitting Nabo Aya and me being 76 years and I'm saying I'm representing um, a, a Sasso branch in Lady Smith. This woman was in our midst, I think she was in her 40s at the time. And immediately, because that was one of the things that we're teaching us, we picked out, we were La. There's a cat smelling. And eventually, when we were breaking off, they, 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 both Steve would go to this woman and eventually they picked up that she was. Because as we're talking, Tina, she was hiding a, 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 a camera. What is it? Is it? No, a, a mic. A mabele noak underneath her bra. They said, after supper we must take care on and then they, they sent all the women the men they gave us their belts they took out the belts and they said go and sort out that lady and we were quite mama why um that it was after the discovery who's also record Hi, Mtanami. Hey, I was giving money hey, so that I can come. And I said, now you see. And said, we said to you, we don't respect women like you. Just, just women. It was us. And she said, when we said it, now we are going to show you where you belong. And then we pulled out. They, all the gentlemen, they gave us, they gave us their bells. 
to workshop. We used to call it workshopping. Okay. And when she started to say, I haven't thought about I'm pregnant. We said, Mam Pila. Mam Pila was a doctor. Mam Pila said, okay, mama, let's go next door. We went to our dormitories. And when Mam Pila came back with her and she had discovered that she was not pregnant, yeah. we beat her up with belts everywhere. Some Shia, you know, you, you see how we were. We didn't even say, hey, she's an elderly. Some Shia, no mama, again, was a ikazi. And at that moment, after beating her, every one of us had a belt on her. We, we escorted it out of Peter Marie's back. It was a, a seminary for training um, uh, Methodist ministers. We, we, we said, leave the campus. Some accompanied her until she left. And it was late at night. We didn't care whether she would be attacked or what. We cared. And then after that, we took all the gentlemen's belt and we say, this is your Strini, this is your Steve. So those formation schools, for me, it's my answer. Thanks, Mama. Uh, another thing, there was no prescription which when somebody's gone for this long, then you will be replaced. Because we had this agency of the struggle. When people go, there's a job to be done. That's why even at TEF, when people were, were detained, we say there's no branch. So we call a meeting. It's the same that happened when the organizations were banned in 1977. We immediately got together and decided we sending people all over the country to form action committees, and then we formed Azapo. So this is how it used. There was no prescription. The thing is, there's the agency. There's this project that was not done. This project that must be done. So we are all in line. It happened at a time when the OJs were here. Everybody was was detained in 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 Houte, in the executive. We were only four who were left. I was due. I was about to give birth, and I had to lead the 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 SASM mat for us to go and talk to the OJs for us to continue with stopping the OJs. And after that, I I was in hospital giving birth. <laughs> so, so there, there there was no time frame. There was the agency. Before I hand over to my colleague Ong as well to close us off, I just want to say thank you so much, um, Bumama, for um, curating into our memory, you know, a spirit of resilience, you know, that is unbroken by the events of 1994, because a lot of us, you know, growing up um, thought that 1994 would be a celebratory moment. But hearing your stories, you know, confirms that actually 1994 did not actually happen. And also how you continue to bring back the university into the conversation as, you know, a site of rebellion. Because currently we're supposed to have a young student, um, former FISMA Fall member joining us, but he couldn't because he's still serving his parole. And the condition is that he cannot participate publicly. Ongezwa will talk to us briefly about Tulikanyo um, after lunch. Ongezwa, please come let us know where we're having lunch. And colleagues, comrades, just remember to take your teacups to the other side, because if we leave them here, then the catering people cannot find them. Can you please give Omama Bey to a round of applause for sharing their stories? Um, thank you, everyone. There were two comments we shall read, and then we're gonna break, go and break bread um, from Ongons. How smooth we are, right? We're gonna, yeah, Angie, we're not gonna be failed by technology. More stories that told women's resistance and, and resilience in time to remember challenging patriarchal control and power. Uh, oh, Dr. Betty moving indeed what the body remember. Um, and then again from VIV, our, resili our resilience came through our belief in acting in solidarity with each other. We were not going through the action of being involved in community building and within communities to meet their needs. And there we go for bread. 
and we're going to be eating just here so you can bring your plates um, and and sit down here there's two events so we are the caterers are a bit challenged about okay in terms of space
Um, we are about to start like in a few minutes. So if everyone can just be seated. I just wanna check with you, Aya, is everything okay there online? So how are we gonna do this, Uzabala? Yeah, anyway, it's gonna echo if like, um, so it's gonna echo if I'm like speaking as well. So what we're gonna do is guys, um, I'll just uh, put a record of all the questions. Then when you ask me if there are any questions online, you can just give me the mic and then I'll also, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's not a thing, The mic is there, man. On this. Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Oh, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. If you can please just be seated. We are about to start, or we're starting now. And I hope you are well nourished, um, just with food and water. Uh, we'd like to thank Unko and Zomkize, who helped uh, with online facilitation. Um, now we'll hand over to Aya Bulele, who's going to facilitate online. I'm on site. Um, there are books on sale um, at the corner and t-shirts. And people online are asking where, um, where can we find the books? So Aya Bunele, can you please just facilitate that and just write down it, uh, write that information down on the chat? Thank you. Um, so for our next, next section with U, Udada umabule mukoni mukone mukine oh mukine mukine the all changes to m. What language is Setswana? Oh, obviously it's the Setswana mukine mabule mukile tato mabule mukine, and the the topic uh, is for this session is Azania Seeds, How Bigo's Life and Work Influenced Me. All right, I will just read 
uba ipa yoyandad. Uma bule mukine works on a freelance basis with several non for profit companies, among which is a Black House Collective, Emutini, Common Purpose South Africa, Ebukosini Solutions, and the Greenhouse Project. He has been a group process facilitator since September 2006 and has 15 years of experience in group process facilitation covering organizational development, diversity and inclusion, leadership, strategy and project inception for prospective clients and community partners. Over to you, Ndate. Kidu Medi se San Bonani, Aushemi, Molueni, um Mangwanani. Mangwanani? Mangwani is morning for Inshona. Yeah. Thank you. Um good afternoon. Um people of the soil. Uh, my name is introduced is Mamule Mukine. Um the topic that I've been asked to speak under is Azanian seeds. Um, and how Pico's life and works through Sasso um, influenced me. I would like to start by prefacing this with this, these words. For me, Azanian seeds are bred from many seeds over many generations, issues and circumstances of the Black condition and the African experience on the continent and in the diaspora. So I will be retelling, you know, the story of these breeds of seed through the sprouts of how Pico's life and works um, influence me. You know, as a person, as a human being um, um, that I have become and that I am. Um, so, I like the flow of storytelling, but I'm going to punctuate it with some insights. And those insights will, you know, be marked by, for example, scene one, you know, and scene one sets for me the backdrop. You know, um, home, upbringing, and storytelling. So I'm born in a home where, when I become aware of my childhood, I learned that six o'clock in the evening, it's time to wrap up whatever we're doing, go and bath and be ready for storytelling. I grew up in a family where the oldest person is the great grandmother who lives up to 114. And the bedroom that she sleeps in has sheepskins on the floor and she sits on the floor by the candlelight. And when we have washed, we sit um, on the Kasetswana Badibizadi party. So when a child is born, um, there is a phase of receiving them into this world because they come from another world. And then there would be, yeah, you see English, English doesn't sit quite well with me, slaughtering, <laughs> you know. Um, and then the, the ship's skin, because Esbatswana Rechawa Pudi Unku, and then the ship's skin will be treated. And so it was, it, was, it was I and my brother, the younger brother, and we'll sit, we'll take our seats on the party by the candlelight, and our grandmother will be sitting on the other end. And she'll be, you know, telling stories. And the stories will start with some kind of a reflection. And eight o'clock, it's supper time. Soon after supper time, our dad switches off the lights, connects to Radio Freedom. And after Radio Freedom, she then, he then takes us through what is happening in the world that we are born into. And he will be very dramatic, you know. Um, so we grew up knowing about, you know, 
persons who are involved in the struggle from the stories that were told by our father, but we are grounded in the reality of being who we are as um, black people and Africans in particular from our grandmother. Um, and it would take me up to the age of 14, um, you know, to realize that some of the stories that our great grandmother was telling, they were about slave labor on the farms in Standerton. So I will pack it there. I will learn, we will learn from our father and from Radio Freedom, hearing the voices of, you know, some of the um, struggle leaders. For example, Samora Michelle would come through, you know, Oliver Tambo would come through and our father will take over and then stretch the net and bring some of the struggle heroes like Almika Cabral um, and weave all of those with some of the people that, you know, when we grow up, the names are familiar, but it's nothing political, like Atifela Belewa Kuti you know, Fela Kuti, who turns out to be a musician in more, but actually he is actually consciousness raising. And what is interesting with Atifela Belewa Kuti, it's the song that plays for well close to an hour, you know, um, about the African woman, you know. And then fast forward, we spent most of our time under the care of our father when we are not at kindergarten because our mother would be at work. When our mother returns from work and the grandmother um, would be, you know, it's time up, it's six o'clock and the routine goes on. Now, why am I sharing this? I'm sharing this because in my family, um, or the home that I was born into, we learned to weave, you know, who we are from storytelling. And unbeknown to us, I can't tell you when, when I started reading, because it was a reading, you know, home. Um, our uncle was working at Star, so there was always newspaper. We always had news headlines. We always had conversation, you know. And some of the conversation, it was more than just talking. I'll give you this scenario. When Solomon Mashang was to hang, um, we had to wake up early in the morning, but it was each one's readiness to wake up. So this one morning, I was ready to wake up. And it was my grandmother, not the great grandmother, and my father, and I joined them at the kitchen. There was no coffee or tea made. My father was standing by the sink and watching through the small window into, you know, the sky or what was outside there. It was early in the morning, dawn breaking. And our grandmother was seated on the chair next to the magic stove, those who know old coal fire stoves. And I walked in and I sat close to our grandmother. And as the clock ticked, when it hit five to six, I couldn't take it. I left, I went back to the bedroom. And after six, we gathered strength and I joined them. But I could hear in the silence, the sighing, you know, um, and that was to present us to the reality of being an African on the continent. I will not unpack that for you. So I'm taking you through an experience. So this morning, our uncle who brings newspaper every time when he comes from work delays. And our father is in the background and he's not saying anything. And our uncle, when he comes through, Ritualistically, he would actually prepare food and will have food with uncle. That would be our breakfast. But this time when he walks in, he doesn't have the newspaper. And he sends me off to the shops. And we had lived through days of helicopters flying and some ugly cars called hippos and some smokes and, you know, so we're living through that. So I'm like, 
I'm like, you know, um, trapped in some kind of fear, but I'm also, you know, courageous to go and get the paper. So I walk out, I run very quickly. Um, we're all like made aware that when you're running in the street that time, you have to run along the fences, the perimeter fences of the neighborhood. So I run along the perimeter fences of the neighborhood. I take a corner. The corner is the uh, former surgery of Dr. Motlan. Turn the corner and then just a block from, you know, Dr. Motlan's um, surgery is the shops. I go to the first shop where we normally buy paper, I bring paper with. As I turn the corner back going home, I flip the front cover of the, of the newspaper. And there is Biko's Cops, you know, a photograph of Biko's Cops, but it's in double image. And I quickly, you know, check what could the double image be from? And I notice that the other image is a reflection of Biko's face, you know, the mirror. And I have questions immediately, you know, but those questions would be answered later and also like passively from watching the movie called Candyman. Those of you who know the movie Candyman, if you don't, you know, it's an invitation, go and watch the movie Candyman because it will help you unpack some of the dynamic of fiddling with, you know, the spirits, you know, in the process of transitioning. And when I get home, you know, I'm already in another state. I'm aware, and I've been aware that there is this name, Biko Biko. And, 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 and it's not just a name, you know, we're living amongst, you know, elder brothers who are mentors, you know, to us, who would fill in, um, you know, the times with story, with um, drawing, with, you know, assembling cans and playing music. There was a lot of improvisation making car wires, you know, lots of stuff. The, the, the neighborhood is a community that is soul. And it only takes one, you know, up to the 80s when the fabric of the soul begins to fragment. You know, uh, women could be, you know, abducted and media will say Jack Rowling in Zola. You know, um, people would be killed with a tire laced with petrol and it'd be called neck lacing. Now, how does Biko begin to influence me? In that period, I take flight in books. And I remember in particular that the first book that is actually um, given to me, it's given like underhandedly. And it's a banned book. I don't know if any of you know it. It was banned at that time. So it's, um, I write what I like. Too Long a Rope by someone, someone LaRue. In fact, um, Professor Sam Peter Terblanche, who is late now, actually draws from that book. And I learn about how corporal punishment becomes mainstreamed into the African family. I learn about, you know, the miscegenation of, um, patriarchy, you know, and this is written by a French Huguenot, you know, person who actually paints a picture before a picture that I can go back to. And the picture that he paints is that corporal punishment is not something that is originates with African people. The patriarchy, you know, this is how it originates. So if you read the book, or if you can't get the book, when you read Sir Peter Lebranch, Sanpi writes clinically. Leroux also does write clinically, but Leroux takes you into the experience. You can see the first settlers coming through. You can see, you know, the incursion and the imposition of the law. You can see, you know, justice, you know, being replaced by the law. You know, you can see um, the law being taken from community to institutions and courts. You, you can actually walk, and that's the beauty of books written in the form of story as opposed to exposition. And, and I notice now that people write mainly exposition. And then what follows after that book is I write what I like. Now, some people actually spoke to this. It's a publication, 1978 Penguin, 
publication, no, Heinemann publication. That publication is no more available. You can't get it. And there you read Biko and you actually get to understand some of the things that are happening in the neighborhood, in your family, by the elders, without them telling you. And one of the scenes that, um, you know, Biko relates is, I call it the bus scene, you know? The bus scene, Biko relates how these, um, you know, parents, men and women would be sitting in the bus and complaining about, you know, white people and, you know, venting their, you know, their frustration and anger for being called boy, girl, you know, and when they walk into the house, you know, um, that immediately becomes the energy that they bring with. But in the morning when they wake up, they have no option, but they have to go back to where they are demeaned, dehumanized, and all of that. And that helped me understand why our father couldn't hold a job. Fast forward, when I was older and ready for my father to actually unpack what Biko articulated, which gave me an insight into some of the misbehavior and dysfunction within you know, our communities and within families. You know, my father says, you know, Zini, my boy, Maybe let me take one step back. So my father would get a job and we'll all be excited. And we'll all be excited that finally he's going to work. He will live very early because he was a confectioner, self-taught, bought himself books. We could see him doing that right in our eyes. He experimented with baking different, you know, products from Kit Kat bread, rye bread, you know, up to your fruitcake wedding, self-taught. And he would live early because the call to duty for the person with his specialties demanded that he must be there first thing, prepare the doughs and everything, warm up the ovens, get them to the right temperature. And when that is done, checks in with the staff that comes in at six o'clock and then hands over to them. 10 o'clock, he's on his way back home. 11 o'clock, he walks through. Oh, his day is done. But each time he got a job, 11 o'clock, he walks back and he's hard for I can't take that. Not me. You know, you know. And in this instance, he sits me down. Now I'm, you know, post varsity, he sits me down. He says, No, Zini. Um, this one time I walk into this confectioner who actually recruited me on the basis that he will give me a better, you know offer for the pies that he was actually preparing for the rivalry, the competitor to this other business. And before that, you know, um, transaction happens, he says to my father, so my father is relating this, says, um, William, um, would you mind to work for me? William says, well, what makes you, what makes you um, want me to work for you. He says, no, man, the pies here are different. You know, they feel, and he says, no, that's fine. How much are you willing to offer me? And then he makes the, the business owner or the shop owner, you know, makes his bid. And my father says, give me some time. Let me think about it. Then you can come to me. Then fast forward, uh, my father accepts the offer, goes to work. And then the, the business owner turns the table. William, I'm um, you know, um, how do you do these things? And he says, no, when you offered me the job, I was going to do them. And in return, you made the offer that I accepted. There was no negotiation around the recipes. And the business owner takes umbrage. And he keeps coming and keeps coming. So this one morning, my father usually, um, time, he goes in there. And the business owner in the two successive days leading to this incident, um, he comes early, it's unusual. But my father also taught us, you must read the situation because it calls you to be present as a black person. So on this morning, this man walks in and he says to the gentleman that has just walked in with the other you know, 
workers who are going to put in, you know, the doors into. He says to this gentleman, um, please take this ladder. I need that thing up there, put it against that shelf. And he calls a black woman who is a colleague to the, you know, the bread making team or the confectionery team. He says, can you please climb up there? And then my father, he's saying all these things. My father is, you know, um, busy doing his final touches. So this guy's talking and my father's back, you know, it's, um, so this person is talking behind my father, but he's actually giving instruction. And then my father turns, he says, now what are you doing? And then this gentleman says, no, it's my shop. It's my store. I said, okay, it's your store. He takes off and he says, now, William, what are you doing? He says, no, it's your store. You can keep it. And he leaves the job. And for a good number of years, all his prospective employers and those that employed him and he left the job kept sending people. And said, no, not go there. There's only one person that he worked for for the longest time. And the reason I asked him why, because he learned to respect me on my terms. And then I asked him, why did you leave your job at the instance that this gentleman said to the lady, climb up the stair? He says, no, he wanted me to feel small so that if I were to concede to be part of that instance, you would tell me, oh, you are useless, William. You are you're resisting with your, you don't want with your recipes, but you can't speak for your women. So if, if you get to understand the psychology that was at play, you know, I mean, we know they were called boys, they were called, but the, 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 the business owner or the shop owner, he was actually manipulating, you know, the, yes. So when I read Pico, it was just giving, you know, or lending insight into realities that would still further unpack like this conversation with my father. You know, the bus scene. The bus scene was not just about black women and black women being called domestic workers and gardeners, cafes, and they would also be put into experiences that actually make them feel powerless. And Biko gives me that lens. The second thing that Biko takes me through, it's the black people's projects. You know, um, and that takes me to what in academic speak they call theory and praxis. What our grandmothers would do, they would actually sing to us. And in the singing, they would actually make us play. And in the playing, when you step back, you realize you've learned something. Like for example, I'll make this song. Um, um, I can't do it in English. So they're teaching you the parts of the body. So you're going exactly, you know. So 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 it's it's play, but it's educating. And and you walk into a classroom, you spend 12 years of your primary. There's nothing like that. You have to sit one row after the other, take instruction. There's so many things. I can't describe them in words. I mean, some of the things would have to do. Um, my father would buy me, you know, um, small, you know, toys uh, for cooking utensils. And, and I, I didn't understand. But it's because the grannies had a very special role to play to educate the parents of what role they need to play and what interventions they need to make at every phase of one's upbringing. Right, so the my father's immediate grandmother, my father's mother, my grandmother, not the great grandmother, you know, would unpack to me some of the things that would help me understand why my father, at that young age, would buy me cars and buy me pots and pens and all of those things, you know, and I'd play with those things, you know. And how this comes through, it's when my grandmother says, Ndate. So Ndate, I am named after their father. So I'm named after my grandfather, right? To say that, don't overwork. 
take things easy, you know? And I would clean, I mean, I'd clean the house, do the curtains, do the garden, you know? And because I liked soccer and, you know, I was good at soccer, then I could go and play soccer, you know? And one day I asked him, but Kuku, why do you always, you know, stop me from working when I'm in the flow of work? He says, because like pain, meaning that if I overwork, I supercharge my nerves. So I must learn to work and then take a break. Now, when I reach 1987, it's a phase shift. I get to what um, is called a private school. But you see the conversations with our father and da 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 that actually prepared me for quite a number of things, you know. Um, from my father's conversations and in the first break, you know, from that school, which was a, a winter vacation. So it's the first year I'm doing grade 11. There they call it M1. And then I walked to my father, but hey, dad, I, I don't understand. I'm starting to experience certain things. He said, my son, you know, when you got the offer, fully sponsored, fully covered, everything paid for, I, wouldn't, I didn't want you to leave. But in the same breath, I didn't feel easy with you continuing education in the location. Remember, people were being necklaced, houses were being banned. Parents would walk and go to school, come back to their houses. Their child is alleged to have been an imbimbi. Their girl daughter has been abducted or something. I mean, I mean those things were happening right in our, you know. But because, you know, it's a catch-22 situation for me. If I refuse, you're still not really, you know, guaranteed anything. And if I let you go, I was expecting this. And he pulls two leadership magazines. I don't know if any of you know leadership. Now, the first publication of that leadership magazine actually gives you, you know, the plan about what to do with the next generation of young black children post 76. So we were a pilot project that gave birth to your model C's and your private schools in accepting black young children and learning how to work with and around them. And we can see the outcomes now. So that's a conversation I have with my father and he gives me those two publications and I read them and I say, Dad, you should have told me, you know, um, perhaps I would, I, would, I would have just like, you know, cut it short and just stayed in the township. But that as it may be, um, the experience in the township in the year that I leave for the school, um, comrades unbeknown to our class, they actually organize themselves across different schools. They come to our class, our class, we are not reluctant to um, elect an SRC, but we don't want to be forced to elect an RSC and seeing how some of the young people ended up in the worst situation, um, you know, with SRC representation that was beyond the politics of student at school. So they bring their leaders, you know, these guys, they walk in and then they're starting, we are born a comrade, gusho gusho guti comrade, you are born a comrade, gusho gusho. And then some of these guys, they begin to turn them. And I sense the tension. And I say, e, whose mother's house or father's house will end up being banned? You know, who amongst us would end up being, you know, dead, killed, you know, because some of my classmates are being very careless. And then I intervene, I said, no, uh, before it, too, it's not that we are reluctant to have an SRC representative, but when we are here, our parents have actually seen that the responsibility, you know, of parenting to our teachers. So if you guys can actually work with our teachers so that you call a parents teachers meeting, we'll actually appoint a number of us to be part of that meeting. And then the tension breaks and then they leave. Fast forward, I meet one of them later when I'm doing community projects, physically in the township, doing what needs to be done. And from our father's teaching, step back, reflect, and see how this thing speaks back to you. If it says, you know, chop me here, you chop it there. So we learn by doing, 
you know, and Pico gave me that as African people, we learn holistically. Um, the Western paradigm says praxis and theory, you know, um, the African paradigm would say praxis, theory, reflection, introspection, then continue. Whether you continue in formulating how you're going to do this, or you continue in doing that thing and then reflect. It's a much elongated you know, process of learning. So on that note, I'm going to cut it short and say, how Biko influenced me, I wouldn't have survived the 80s. I wouldn't have survived the period that we are in. I wouldn't have survived private school. I wouldn't have survived the antagonism between men and African women as we see now manifest with GBV and all sorts of things. Thank you. Um, I'm just gonna, does anyone have any question on that? Uh, and uh, um, so end, end now, um, uh, would be, uh, what do you say to a young woman who subscribes to the trashless narrative? What do you say to a young woman who says men are trash? What do you say to, what do you say to a young woman who says, because you are men, you are black, you are South African men, and therefore you are trash, you are trash? Thank, thank you for and my time. Thank you for us for raising that question. So um, maybe let me start it off this way. I'm married to a woman who helps me understand the dynamic of women rage that is not informed. When I was in my mid-teens, I'm hanging out with the guys, and you know, guys would um, um, name call. And name call changes with time to time and context. So I'm hanging with these guys, and they're going, hey, why not get tea? I mean, that this girl is tea. So you know what, tea, tea, when you drink it in the morning, drink it at day, you can drink it any time, you know? And I'm listening to this conversation and something is not kosher with me, like, ah, nah. and then finally I pluck courage and say to them, well, I don't know what you think and how you feel about your mom being a woman, because I am born of a woman. I have sisters. And I can't imagine myself calling them tea. And that conversation breaks immediately and we leave for home. And the next morning, first thing in the morning, I get a call. Back then, I mean, we used to have landline. So I get a call and this brother says, I am Zinana, you know what you said yesterday? It's true. Meaning that in the moment, it is good, you know, we peer pressure it, you know, but when I decided to take a stand and call it out, for some it landed, and it landed in such a way that they could actually concede and make peace with that awareness. To this day, most of the guys that we were friends, I was friends with, those that have remained with me, they have remained deeply respectful of the complementarity between men and women. Those who fell off, is because they couldn't withstand facing themselves and conceding the complicity in, you know, bashing women. So the flip side of it is in answering your question, when women say men are trash, it's because it's ill-informed. You know, what that means is that the first classroom you know, before you even know a classroom, before you even know how to talk, before you even know how to walk, it's your mother. Your mother would know things that you do not know about yourself and would nudge your father to play the role that he needs to play. And this, in my instance, 
my mother, when we were in our late teens, she said, hey, Bafana Bam, that's me and my younger brother. I said, Bafana Mian Zuen. My mother is Zulu, by the way. My father is Tuan. Mian Zuen, because I wonder what women you are going to marry. My mother was the strength and the pillar of the family in her silence. Um, boom, they are quiet. Oh, my tool. You know, they are quiet. But one day I walk with a friend, he's a colleague, he's an older sister. And as we walk through my, my home gate, he says, I know where the power lies. She's a woman, she would understand it. And I'm like, curious, where, where does the power lie between my mother and my father? My father was handsome. My mother was also like beautiful, you know? But it was the kind of beauty that is silent and not beauty that is just on the face. But she was very silent. She spoke when the need, there was a need to speak and she would chide you softly. The one person that feared our mother was our brother, the naughty one. One day I asked him, why is it that when dad chides you, the next thing you repeat it, but when it's umama chiding you, you stop it. He said, when our mother speaks, it hits me here. Meaning that side, there is, there is power in knowing where your power lies as a woman, how you work with it. My mother knew her power was in silence. And she knew that part of that power is knowing when to speak, how to speak, what to say. And our, our mother said to me, Long before our father said, you know, shared all these injustices and dehumanization, my, our father, mother sat us down and said, I understand the struggle of your father. It's not easy, my boys. You will grow, you will understand. What I ask of you is to cooperate with your father. Sometimes when he's angry and he's shouting and he's ranting, you know, understand when you grow you will understand better so women who or girls that who say all men are trash it comes from a place of you know ignorance we share the same thing with uh no monday no monday's father was like my father mm -hmm. the advantage with no monday's family is that her mother was femme and he had the build and you could actually you know my mother was a bit demed, but there was, in both instances, our mothers knew that you hold the sharp edge of the knife. Thank you. I hope I've answered you. Um, thank you, Tate um, Mamule. And for always, you know, um, sharing these stories that should be in, in, in the books, in the library books of our universities and schools, but are not there. Um, mine is a, is, a, is a selfish question, but an important question nonetheless. You seem to me to represent, you know, a, a local, by local, I mean Soweto version of Amazon DD, at least your generation and what the state was trying to do in terms of, you know, creating is Fundiswa Namakola on their own terms. Um, and you also come from Deep Luf. For those of you who don't know, Deep Luf is the sentin of Soweto. So, um, but somehow your dad seems to be going against the grain and in raising you and speaking against what, you know, Deep Luf was designed for. Um, I just want to perhaps you, you could take us through, you know, as a young person growing up in that space and understanding that, you know, Deep Kloof is destined to produce the next layer of the black middle class, not class, the black middle class. Maybe you could take us through that. Thank you. Yo. Mm. <sighs> Maybe let me let me start it this way. You are so on point. I mean, when people walk into Deep Groove, they say, ah, Deep Groove is a suburb. Um, a lot of people who are not aware, um, you know, the electrification of townships starts in Deep Groove. The tiring of roads starts in Deep Groove. Um, Deep Groove becomes positioned as another Dube, Rockville, you know. 
Um, and it becomes a testing ground for how black people respond to electrification, tart roads, and you know. Um, yeah, Deep Kloof. And Deep Kloof becomes a, you know, that, that question takes me to something very peculiar about Deep Kloof. I mean, the, by and large, many parts of Soweto are predominantly PC and Pan-African. I mean, we know when you go to Orlando East, you know, um, it's PC Pan-African, uh, Pinville, PC Pan-African, Zolam Deni, PC Pan-African, you know. But Deep Kloof, it's purged of any PC sentiment. I mean, there is a, again, it's another silenced piece of history. When um, the 76 um, student, um, you know, planned to march, not too much, but to emerge in the city center of Johannesburg, because they had planned to emerge in the city center of Johannesburg, not, not marching. So they actually would have bricks, you know, um, you know, carrying them as if they're carrying books, those who are using taxis, you know, but taxi was not really much of, you know, mode of transport, but it was buses and trains. And they would find themselves in the city of Johannesburg and then they emerge, you know, with those things. There was a group that, um, were, were, there were groups that were marching. The one group that was marching was, was planned to march from Shaft 17, you know, where if, you, if, if any of you know Soccer City, so the main road that, you know, cuts through or along Soccer City is called Soweto Freeway. And it's called, part of it is called Shaft 70, where you see the mine dumps. And when you're driving into Deep Loof, you actually drive through those mine dumps. And when you go down the mine dumps, then there's Deep Loof, there's Soweto, you know? And it's called Shaft 70. So Abi Libelo is taken out, you know, as students march, those students who are marching and those who are going to march are going to meet in the city and is taken out in shaft 17. And to this day, nobody knows why it was only him who was shot and he died. But what is certain is that he was killed by the police. Now, when you think about how oppression reinvents itself, Deep Kloof is a reinvention of oppression from Duwe and Zola, you know, is positioned as the next face of Amazon deed. Mm -hmm. And not only that, generationally, you always have to co-opt, you know, the younger generation to position them for Amazon deed. You know, with the earlier, you know, um, um, Amazon deed, at the very founding, you get priests, teachers, you don't get lawyers then. But if you go back and you ask, who were the first teachers? Who were the first uh, priests? They were sons and daughters of kings. And those were closer to the royalty. Now you don't get that in a whim. I mean, you have to read, you have to be in conversation and some people will share their own insights. And some of them, they share those insights from lived experience. Bakula Ekaya, the father is a priest. And then they are at loggerheads with the father being a priest and, you know, them having to behave in ways that are not in sync with the demands of the time, the demands of society. Um, I mean, you're sitting with friends and one friend says, hey, but you know, Mkina, you know, playing Bob Maliman takes me back to the early, the late 70s, early 80s. Now, what people may not be aware of you couldn't play, you couldn't wear dreadlocks in the 70s. Tina, we witnessed it. I mean, we were playing with my brother in the yard. And if police vehicle just stopped, these guys, you know, never be my, you know, um, my hippie, you know, Rasta came after, you know. Police just stopped there, picked them up, and our dad quickly, you know, came through and debriefed us. Now, this is what is happening. And because we're in shock. He was very present, our father. Unlike our mother, our mother was silent, quiet, but he played her role behind the scenes, you know? 
I mean, imagine you're going to bed and you are still traumatized by this image of a police vehicle just suddenly stopping and then Nina, you were just playing and having fun. And you saw two adults, you know, with um, hair that is very unusual and they were taken in. You can't go to sleep, you know, with, with that memory. It will play itself out in other ways. I mean, when I was younger, between um, childhood and adolescence, I was wake up in the middle of the night flying, you know. I'm sometimes flying from a police vehicle. I mean, how do I get myself into a police vehicle at that age? It's playing memory, you know, from trauma, you know. So how was it like growing in? That is a very profound question. Um, I mean, you had luminaries like Dr. Motlana surgery. You had the Butelezi family and their father was the first a black um, radio presenter of Bukosi, the Butelezis. You had Dr. Nyembezi, the Nyembezis are known um, even as writers, and the houses were quite unique and outstanding from the rest of the houses. I mean, Dr. Nyembezi's house um, straddles four um, township houses, the way it speak, and it was the one of its kind. Um, the, the Butelezi family straddles two houses there, you know, two yards of a typical standard house in Duke Roof. And Dr. Motlana's um, surgery, you know, overlooked the open space um, across which there was a, a library, you know, and old municipal, I say old because it's no longer the municipal office, you know. So you have these families, um, you know, stature in society, not only just in the community, in society and the so all sorts of people who come through the community, the neighborhood that, you know, um, bring worth and awareness that this is a different community, right? I mean, the same thing happens in, in Dube. I mean, if you go into Dube, we had the Skakanes in Dube, you know, um, the teachers, you know, and then, I mean, when we go to Dube, you could tell that it's not your average, you know, African family that stays here. And you start to have questions. And because our mother comes from, you know, a family of teachers, our great, you know, our grandfather was a teacher. You know, when you read Pixley, the Isaka Semes, how he comes to be an advocate and why he refuses to take the first presidency of the ANC on the back of your mother's family history. You have a different understanding of Pixley, um, you know, saying, well, I'm not born of royalty. People who are born of royalty, you know, would actually create unnecessary tensions and conflicts, whereas the cause should be transitioning from, um, you know, the struggle of Amakosi to a struggle post Amakosi, bearing in mind that Pambata was the last, the Pambata rebellion was there. So it's, it's hard to, you know, when I mean, you know, relating these things, I also like to go to the practical things, you know. Um, growing up in Deep Kloof, you have people who innovate, not really innovate, but they're responding to the times. There are no amenities, but black people always, always, you know, started things. I mean, when you talk about Orlando Pirates, one of the founders of Orlando Pirates that we know today, but which is different from the Orlando Pirates of then. I mean, that is why when Orlando Pirates, the transition, you know, the, the shift of Orlando Pirates from being a people's club to a private club came in with a loss of many lives, a loss of, and people don't understand, they think it's just about soccer and, you know, but some of the people, not even some, the one person that was part of the Abu Baba who started they lived just across my home from my grandfather mother's place, uh, Baste, you know, the Musi family, you know. Um, so when 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 I grew up in Deep Kloof, ah, soccer was something. I mean, I rocked soccer. I rocked soccer, I mean, uh, up to the age of 14, and then some weird incident happens. Um, we all had, for example, I mean, they used to call me disco, you know, uh, and disco is... It's, 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 it's a genre of music, but disco also is a genre of music that is related to dance, you know? So when I played soccer, I would play soccer like I am dancing, 
and people would actually sing, you know, this go rock machine, and when they do that, I'm in the spirit now, you know, and then I'm, I'm doing my thing and I give you the ball, you give me the ball, you know, give me the ball, I give you the ball, you know. Um, so um, it was, it was fun and I really respect our elders because they knew what role to play unlike, and I don't blaming it, but I'm saying, let's, let's hold a mirror to ourselves, the elders of now, you know, of the money. They protect us, us from the brutality, from the crass brutality of apartheid. You grew and you thought, wow, oh, this life is fun until you met the first white person, until you went to town for the first time. Like someone was relating and my father was, oh yeah, umam tefni. You know, uh, walking on the pavement, it was, you know, preserved, reserved for white people. <laughs> yeah, I mean, now my father, when we went to, to town, you know, he made sure that he gets um, Ndate, I'm trying to remember his name, he may be Ndate Allen. He would hire a special taxi. We go to Ilof Street, you know, he drops off, off Ilof Street. We dash into um, greater men's or we dash into Woolies. And then when the time is ready for us to go back, um, you know, that they, I forget his name. He comes, he parks here, he picks us up. We go. So we don't experience, you know. But, but who could afford making arrangements like that from time to time to go and shop clothes for their children? Who could afford to do that? So going to town was, was uh, what is it? It was exactly. Yeah, it was, it was. You know, I mean, you looked forward to going to town, you know. Um, for others, I mean, because they had no option, they had to live through the trauma of seeing their parents being humiliated and, you know, coming back and the older doesn't say anything. And then as you grow older, you're also boiling with anger because you couldn't process the experience. There was nobody to talk to. You couldn't debrief it with, well, we've got words now debriefing with but Tina, we, Tina, and we talk, <laughs> you know, yeah. I hope I've answered you, Zandi. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, last one, Dad. Uh, a comrade of mine used to say every black person needs the, the confrontation with whiteness to bring themselves into uh, consciousness, right? The, que the question I want to ask is when that, because most of us who grew up in townships and rural areas, we spend a lot of time, especially. I'm sure it's true for you in the 80s and 90s and 70s, but it's also true for most of us who grew up in the 90s and the 2000s, that we do not see white people, right? We spend a lot of time hearing about the badness of white people, but we, know we mostly don't see them as we grow up until you are a certain age, of course, or if you are lucky, your parents were white people, or you go to town and you meet them but we feel the after effect of whiteness or white supremacy because the township in itself is a creation of white people. Now, my, where my question is going is that, how was that first experience of the white man and his brutality and his badness? Because I know for me, the first white man I met was my father's boss. I think it was Mr. Van Parahoyen or something, Martin Van Parahoyen. That's the first white man I met. But of course, my experience at the time, because I was still young, my experience of him is not as brutal, right? But I know, I remember him shouting at my father one day, you know what I'm saying? I remember a white man where we stayed with my father, because my father looked after a reservoir of water in Tuzum. Uh, if there are people from Tuzum, they will know NR2, Echo F-17 in Tuzum. At some time, it, the, 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 the operating room, which was very big, got burned. But let me tell you a bit of a story when what happened before God bent. My father is not an engineer, no, a, a technical person. He was working in admin, but he had worked in the water space for a long time. Now this guy, I think it was a chemical engineer or mechanical engineer or something, but he was usually came, he was a white guy, Michael something, usually came wearing a white coat, you know, those lab coat. So one day he comes, I think before the problem of fire begins, there's a problem inside he's running in and my father stops him and tells him, no man, don't go. If you go do this and this and this or else there will be a problem. Of course, the white man, one is a white man, two is more educated. 
He doesn't listen. He goes inside, don't know what he touched, the whole place bent. And remember at that time, those who know Uchichi government, you stayed in teen houses if you were working for them because you went around in these camps. So that's where we stayed, like literally opposite the building. You know, I, I remember as a young boy running out, we were slightly looking and I was teary because um, little, the way um, cool corner, it felt like it would bear, would bend the tin houses we stayed in. But my question is, <laughs> the long story, but my question is that first experience, the first confrontation with whiteness and white people for you look like, how does it feel with that backdrop of the long message? Okay. Um, painful, scary, confusing. Very. I think I think our dad played a very important role in holding us to reflection and because um were it not of him playing that part and the and the older brothers who it turned out were mentored by him. You see, in case into of age, umdala by age, but by iron or itlalayo to those who are coming after him. So some of them we learned after his death that he was actually um he actually brought the consciousness school. You know, Ekaya. I remember we were young. I think we were in our um, uh, primary school, primary age, yes, school. And there used to be two boxes. Yeah. The one box, it always had coal and firewood. It was only when he had passed on that we're told, you know, but that's where books, banned books by the state were kept and would actually be taken out and you know be passed on from one person to the other who sells. <laughs> you get it. This one morning we wake up, there's a knock on the front door. My father wakes us up. He gets us into the dining room. He sits us down. He tells us, we keep quiet. He attends to the knock. And then once these guys are gone, he comes, he opens up. And then he debrief. He plays that role. There was one white policeman standing in the at the front door. The one who was knocking at the back door, you know, didn't. It was not as if he was the only person. And then he tells us, you know, why they were there. So it is fearful, you know, scary, confusing. Thank you. Um, I mean, what? What comes out beautifully is for me, um, which is an obsession of mine, is that oral storytelling is the oldest form of teaching, which if which you really, if you engage this movement of oral storytelling, it's also a, a form of archiving. It's also what I, I'm learning as I continue, because it's my a bit of an obsession. What it does, it archives languages across the African countries and the form in itself across the Atlantic and slavery trade. And it exists within time, with space and time. And it's embodied. So knowledge sits on the body as our oppressions sits on the body. We're not gonna leave our bodies behind, right? And the pedagogical tool that is in the house, right? So what happens is we send our children to these schools. In Ghana, I'm a woman. Right? 
And these are songs that tell stories. And so that's where we are. And go send that, isn't it? And I just needed to highlight even more the pedagogical tool of oral storytelling in Ganilgan and how far and we are doing this now. There you go. Ngasboni Sanya. Business Kulum. We know where we come from. And so it's truth I know my name. Okay. And yes, but there will be a time for you just now, right? So next session is um, called Fenon's Combative Decolonial Transcendence of Psychoanalysis. Um, Are you? So, Unelsin, you guys met yesterday. Unelsin, it's not, it's not Nelson more. Unelsin. So you've got a. <laughs> are you guys standing there? Yeah. Oh, you're sitting here. Which one is comfortable? Okay. So Nelson, and then. Ndade Mohammed said that um, I'm just scrolling up and down. Heads the Institute for Social Health Sciences at the University of South Africa. He directed the Violence, Injury, and Peace Promotion Research Unit, a, nas a national UNISA and South African Medical Research Council initiative. For 19 years. His current scholarship revolves around liberation, critical decolonial community, social psychology, the social anatomy of protest, emancipatory approaches to health, safety, peace, promotions, um, psychologies underlining life skill, socio political transformation in post-colonial colonial context. Transdisciplinary knowledge architectures and indigenous knowledge making spaces. Udade Muhammad continues to support community engagement research, the capacitation of next generation social engaged researchers and academic leaders and the transformation of writing cultures in uh, of numerous educational bodies, of science of South Africa. And um, Shanaz, uh, who's setting up the Selvin, mm -hmm. Associate mm -hmm. Senior Researcher Affiliated with the South mm -hmm. Research Council, President mm -hmm. of the Psychology mm -hmm. Research Interest going from Intersections of Critical African Community and Peace Psych Psychologies and Public Health. Um, and are located within laboratory yeah. and epistemology and thinking and scholarship are influenced by the vision of research as a transforming and humanizing and decolonizing enterprise. Her research interests, including a focus on community engagement, uh, engaged interventions in contexts of structural and epistemic violence, participatory engagement on a site of activism, resistance, and social change, and African knowledge and knowledge making. 
We're still setting up. Okay. Okay. Yeah. From me. From stretch. Okay. For the afternoon session. Okay. Um, caught me off guard. Um, but we can still do it. Just uh, if you can make it start. Yeah. Oh, Joe. Mom, already because we leading the movement. We're going to lead the movement, or they. So we're going to. Okay. We're doing doing as a form of preparation, right? And and I, I believe Lele is already spread, spreading her hands us. Someone can offer another movement. Okay. So there we are. Okay. And there we are. Okay. And so I'm, someone else offers another movement. Someone changes it and offers another move it, take it. Okay, here we are. Here we are. Oh, and then there's another one from Uzimasa. <laughs> okay. There's the rhythm coming in, right? Okay. And if you can slowly, oh, there's another finger. Oh. Okay, if you can just be grounded on that, deep breath in and out. In and out, in and out and i just want you to without talking just look into the eyes of the next person next to you without talking without touching anyone and deep breath in And out. Deep breath in and out. Without talking, just don't. Just observe what happens with your body. Do we actually take time to see each other? So the prompt now is I'm going to ask you to really see each other with all the work that we do, with all the things that we carry, with all the people that we come with. Those who are here, those who are no longer here with us. And here we stand and we see each other. On that note, when you're good and ready, you may take a seat.
Good afternoon, comrades, friends, colleagues. They asked me to speak up, so is that good, technical team? Yeah. All right. Um, so Nelson, Mohammed, and I are doing a combative dance of sorts. That's all the music, musical instruments here. Um, but to get us started, what we want to do is share with you a very brief video clip, which I'll give some context to in a moment. For our online audience, um, apologies, but we do not have copyright permission to share this clip. So I guess we are disconnecting with you for, uh, for just a moment, disconnecting from you. May I? May I continue? Yeah. Sound? No sound? We told uh, our elder to take that out, but now in 2000, we told that there is nothing that is possible to make now. We had no pets, there was no worker, they had no trail, so they know that they didn't do what has been the, the project we had with uh, a kid that we were using. Around uh, four the communal heads, the one who put the trolley with the bucket in the store. Uh, my name is Fahim Damia. I'm a resident of San Benito for the past 25 years. I'm an activist. In 2001, the AD government, uh, they wanted us to put the airport in a place called Clapanji, which is about seven, ten kilometers away from where we are. When you try to introduce the project, they said people will be chasing out that particular But now after they change, they said you have break down your, your shell and then you're going to build it in that particular People change their mind. They said, no, we're not going anywhere now. The first orientation, people that are green, that were willing to move, move to a move in 2001 for that then the rest of those that stayed behind and were decided to say we go nowhere. They wanted the first time they needed to build towers. The government would be really picking up from shed picture. So why have to take it? They were very safe shed that we were digging into a two-part one day where we will erect your own care. But government uh, has got some evidence that the uh, body on which the community is living in that case. Uh, so in other words, it's not it's not very good for human habitation. So people have to relocate. The third relocation happened in 2001. But the fact that they've been around losing we were determined to say we will live in in whether they like it or not, people will decide to in people, then you know, having this force in removal. What if we were united in one point for the same? We want our place a place where we call it our house. That's the way the real thing now, the real fighting started in 2001. And people of freedom, the people who don't know what they want. But we have said it would be dead now. The dead is in this country, what they normally do. They don't come from bad, 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 bad,
Sorry about that. Is that okay? So we've had we've we've had a very moving and profound day of storytelling. Um, and even though the three of us are going to speak in a slightly different way, just uh, in our presentation, um, we hope to pick up on the centrality of storytelling and the value it has as we think about thinking from the ground or rethinking from the ground as Nelson had talked about yesterday. Um, and to make the links equally with the notions of social suffering and, and radical healing that emerged um, today, certainly today, but uh, we heard this yesterday as well. So this clip that we shared um, is extracted from a participatory documentary that our community partners from the community of Tembelichle in the south of Johannesburg co-produced with us as part of a community storylines project. And this project offers a platform for the making um, and the sharing of, of counter stories and combative stories um, by community activists and unrecognized knowledge makers. And for these stories to be amplified and to be shared in different ways and across um, different spaces. And although this is a really quite a short clip and a, in, in many ways, a single representation of a very complex um, community story, we are hoping that it will give you some sense, uh, some kind of granularity, if you want, of the content to which we will talk about in the session. Um, um, and, and Mohammed will elaborate on that uh, later in our presentation. I'm gonna hand over to Nelson in a second, Nelson. Before I do, uh, I want to say, as uh, before you step into what I'm calling the dance, that um, the work that we're talking about today and the collaboration that we're elaborating on um, between the uh, Institute for Social and Health Sciences and, and Comrade Nelson rep represents very much forms of coming together in ways that are focused on and is directed at strengthening uh, decolonial spaces, decolonial knowledges, decolonial praxis that are directed at uh, combativity. It, it represents a kind of methodology, and I really do want to make the point about this. It represents a kind of methodology that Sir Zandi and, and Nelson talked of yesterday in their presentation as we opened, when they talked about the convergences and the complement, complementarities that bring their work together. Um, and I'm, I guess I'm, I'm highlighting this because I think this is as important to underscore um, as is the content of our presentation, as you make sense of how it is that we're talking about Tembelichle um, and, and um, Nelson talking about um, uh, transcending psychoanalysis. So with that as a brief, brief introduction, um, Nelson, I don't know if you want to step into the dance. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> and I have to set up a couple of presentation here. It takes me hopefully one second. Okay. He's doing it for you. Oh. He's doing it for you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, no. Oh, yeah. you are moving it there? Yeah, he's moving. Okay. Okay, and then you can, okay, you can leave it there. Perfect. Beautiful. Thank you. Oh, if he does it from there, then maybe I can sit. Maybe I can sit there. I think so. Yeah. Okay, I like the now the more intimate space. We know each other. We have been here for more than 24 hours together, so we can talk to each other. 
So as uh, I mean, as Shenas was saying, uh, we have been collaborating for some time now. Uh, Mohammed and and her uh, are uh, professional trained, I think, combative psychologists. And uh, I come from the area of philosophy and critical theorizing and other forms of combativity. And so uh, we have found each other um, um, in these schools and then the dialogues have led us to discover um, many ideas in common, which is no mystery in a way, because when I say that I, when I'm coming from philosophy and critical theory, uh, I have for more than two decades now um, studied carefully the work of Franz Fanon. So Franz Fanon is my main, let's say, reference in, in my work. Uh, he was a philosopher, theoretician, but he was also a psychiatrist. So, oh wonder, I end up with a gang of psychiatrists or psychologists, right? What a mystery. Uh, and what a mystery that they are doing things that are also in conversation with what Fanon was doing all, all the time. This is actually the psychiatric hospital in Blida where Fanon, um, he was the director in Algeria. And you have to consider that Fanon was an Afro-Caribbean subject, right? Uh, who could have spent his life going to either France or back to Martinique, not get involved at all with the Algerian revolution at all. But when he was there, he actually resigned from his position as director of the hospital and joined the revolution. But that doesn't mean that when he was in the hospital, he was doing work that was combative just in another time and in another space, in another institution, which raises the question of the different modalities of combativity in different spaces, right? So we have now learned quite a bit. And I'm so pleased that we, now all of us have met uh, more members of the Black House and have heard from them about what the Black House, how they, um, how they have grown uh, in the Black House, how they have been in this dialogue, different generations, different views, different knowledges. And so I think that the, the, the Black House is one of these uh, border zones of the colonial activity, right? Because people with different orientations, different ages, and then, but then it's not in this array. There is, we are calling Cisandia, uh, myself, uh, uh, Papa Huey, uh, Rituli, and other members of the of the Black House, we will have we have been referring to the notion of the Black House paradigm. In a sense, to, it's a tentative name to convey the notion that it is not simply uh, a kind of loose combination of elements coming together, right? But that there is, in fact, uh, Shanas calls it a methodology. There is a way in which this all tries to respond to the questions: How do we liberate ourselves? How do we conquer? Not conquer. How do we uh, explore and how do we increase our spaces of freedom in spaces that completely you know, militate against our, our freedom and our well-being. So the Black House is one of those sites and you have seen the powerful contributions um, and exercises from that space. So what would it be to try to do a combative action within a space that is a part of the academy? You don't have um, you have certain resources that maybe the Black House doesn't have, but you don't have the freedom, right? And uh, I mean, we're talking about very different spaces, very different. But if you, while you are in the, in the hospital or in the academy, wherever you are in these institutions that have been created by this order, then the question is the extent to which while we are there, how can we, if we can create these border zones border zones, and then coming back to border, also in conversation with the poems yesterday, conversation yesterday, how to create and increase border zones of the colonial activity to combat anti-blackness and advance decoloniality, even with the constraints and contradictions of spaces of these, for the most part, liberal spaces inside the academy. How can you stretch, create, right? expand, push, and then link with the outside. 
because I think that the linking with the outside is absolutely indispensable. And what if you are in a, a, a what if you are in a place that physically you are close to, a, to communities that are vulnerable in places of extreme vulnerability, right? So when Fanon was a director of the hospital, remember he was actually going traveling to the communities around the hospital, getting to know the people, their customs, their religious practices, their spiritual practices, right? And countering the dominant view of the established science and the state that render those communities as primitives, right? They are the ones, they are, the, they are relying on ideas and beliefs that are anti-modern in all fundamental ways. And of course, for, for the Europeans, modernity is, is, is an extraordinary thing that everyone should aspire. And Fanon, through this critical investigation, he uh, discovers on, on foreseen, you know, unseen areas for the people like him that come from the outside. And also um, that contact allows him to be more profoundly critical of modernity, of the discourse of Western modernity. But imagine what would it be then if you are a doctor, you're not, you know, in that moment, Fanon was not in, in a place like the Black House. Fanon was in a place like, you know, a, an official institution of medicine. So how can you from there operate? Um, and could you pass it to the next one, please? The next picture. So that's Dr. Fanon in the middle. And we often, you know, we are accustomed to see Fanon uh, completely in the revolutionary mode, right? But remember, this Fanon, and this Fanon was also in Africa, but remember, it's North Africa. It's North Africa. And it's a place that he could have said that, and he was coming from the Caribbean. I mean, that opens a number of issues about belonging, how you belong, commitment. I think we, we're going to get to that. So now Fanon was a representative for, for the Algerian Liberation Front uh, in, parts of you know, sub-Saharan Africa. And that's why from there his Pan-Africanism. And there are reports that he wanted to come to South Africa after Algeria was liberated. So his commitment was very expansive, but he was, this is his team. He's in the middle, doctors. So what do you think that someone, Dr. Fanon, would be able to do in there, right? And there was a revolution and he joined the revolution, but imagine, as he, as Fanon wrote in Blaskin White Mask, that the revolution is not, to, is not today, it's too soon or too late, it will not happen today. You know, what if the revolution was not really taking place very, you know, he arrived and very suddenly all of this is going. So imagine that no, the Algerian revolution will have happened three decades later or not happened. What would he do in a combative mode there? What do you do while the revolution, you know, is coming or when do you know that is coming? That's, a, that's also an important question. But while you are there, what do you do? How do you behave in, in these institutions? And I think that this animates a little bit. So we're changing channels. Imagine we were in the Black House. Imagine that we walk now in front of the, inside the hospital with a team of researchers. And what kind of intervention? And I think that our attempt to, the, to talk about the Black House paradigm, that what we're doing in this paper is a parallel process because what we are doing is, well, we're in the process of maybe naming this, let's say, methodology. Maybe it's the colonial methodology for healing. Uh, and we have a name that we'll be discussing related to that uh, soon. But immediately as you enter the terrain in, a, in, in the academic discourse, you realize that something called psychoanalysis is quite dominant. And so we wanted to point out at least one of the fundamental differences between this, let's say, methodology uh, um, paradigm that we're developing and this um, dominant one, which is psychoanalysis. Now, Fanon himself critically explored psychoanalysis in black skin, white masks. And actually, uh, so it's not a stretch. I were here in conversation, Fanon as an ancestor, and he was a student. When he wrote black skin, white masks, he was very young. He was actually still before getting his PhD. He thought at one moment that maybe Black Skin White Mass, he would submit it for, uh, as his dissertation, right? So think about it. We have Fanon the student, Fanon the doctor, and then Fanon the 
revolutionary. And I think in each of these phases and facets, he left us many lessons that we're still uncovered in digging and then the interconnection between them, right? As we are here, I think the school is becoming a place where we have the presence of different projects, let's say different border zones of the colonial activity that we come here to share and exchange ideas and not only contemporary, but also across generations. So maybe it would be it would be a Fanonian school after all, follow. So we have Fanon the student, Fanon the doctor, Fanon the revolutionary. If we go to Fanon the, the student, I think he's grappling in black skin white mass with a number of issues, many of them theoretical. And so in our paper, we talked about the Fanon's transcendence of psychoanalysis as a theory and as a practice, as a theoretician, but also as a clinician, as a practitioner. He, in our view, he did in both levels. Right? Typically in psychology, you find this kind of divide between let's say the theorists and the clinicians, right? And maybe you are in one, Fanon, I mean, Fanon was, he said, well, I will take on both because I see both are related, but I'm not satisfied with either. And they, I would have to do something else. And that begins when he was a young student. Now, the first thing that in his, he basically, he decided not to submit because he said that he realized that working on the problem of blackness and anti-blackness or the reality of, of blackness and then anti-blackness and the impact of anti-blackness require a multi-area investigation. He could not simply, and usually when you write a dissertation, you do it for a field, for a discipline where you demonstrate mastery of a discipline. He was saying, the problem that I'm investigating requires more than one discipline. There is no way that I'm going to reduce it to a nar that narrow form. So I will submit something else and I will give myself the freedom to write this. Now, more than 60 years after, what are we reading mainly? What he submitted as the, as the degree and was accepted by his teacher or this other work that was not acceptable at the time? And you often wonder what kind of work today is not acceptable today that maybe it's the one that will be read decades ago. And hopefully schools like this, like this foster that kind of work, right? That's the, at least the, the goal and the inspiration. You know, the, the, let's say the, the revolutionary, if you will, spirit of Anon was demonstrated right there in the introduction of Black Skin, White Mask, because um, he has a few epigraphs in the text, you know, those little passages at the beginning of, of, of each chapter or, or a book. And in this case, he decided to, to cite not an authority in psychiatry or psychology or philosophy of these European authorities, but a fellow Martinican, Afro-Caribbean, uh, intellectual theoretician, poet, author, Emesser. And so with Emesser, he connected himself with a dialogue that other Caribbean people and people from the African diaspora in Africa were having at the moment. That was, you know, that's where I'm taking my, my clue and my key to think. And the quote reads as follows. This is from MSSR, Discourse on Colonialism. And Discourse on Colonialism also is not this elaborate theoretical treatise with these old fashionable words and right, it's a very, I mean, very creative, very evocative. So it was also kind of brave to go there and, and, and take it. And this doesn't mean Fanon was also reading and engaging and he himself produced very uh, technical concepts and vocabulary, but he was still telling that in the, as an epigraph he takes from this book, which would not have been authorized or taught in any given department or place or the university at that point, would have surely not been taught in any place. And it reads, I am talking about millions of men whom they have knowingly instilled with fear and a complex of inferiority, whom they have infused with despair and trained to tremble, to kneel, and to behave like flunkies. So he decided to write about those millions of people who have been instilled, infused with this despair and feeling of inferiority. That is what Blas King Y Mass tries to be. And precisely uh, in the effort of kind of propelling 
an interest and a desire for self-emancipation, for self-emancipation. Anyway, the transcendence of the discipline of, I think, psychology, psychiatry, psychoanalysis, I think consists, you can see it in three different clear levels or actions. One is that he was, as I said, bringing the multiple areas. He brings sociology, anthropology, cultural studies, you name it. And that's why the book is read in so many different fields today and areas in the academy. He also critically engages the fields that he's drawing on. So he draws on psychoanalysis, but he criticizes Freud. He draws on Hegel, but he criticizes Hegel. So he doesn't go simply to apply, to take and apply. He critically revises in light of what? Of the complexity and richness of the question of what it means to be black in the modern world. And thirdly, he not only incorporates multiple elements that are often not mixed and then critically interrogate them, but also invents and creates new concepts and new ideas. So there are kind of at least a threefold activity that I think, you know, I think that the paper is pointing in this direction that these three and potentially more uh, characterize this transcendence of psychoanalysis as a theory. Why? Because he was doing this. Now, the, he was also doing uh, transcending psychoanalysis as a practice. And this is the shift that we see between this and the next slide. Right? Which is the Fanon that is already, you know, part of the, the, in the liberation movement. Now I want to read you um, a section of Fanon's letter to the minister that had appointed him to the position of director. I want to share some lines of the letter of resignation for you to see that transcendence of the position of psychologist. And he writes the following, madness. This is him to, to his boss, basically, right? Resigning from the position of director. Madness is one of the means the human being have of losing their freedom. And I can say on the basis that I have been able to observe from this point of vantage, that the degree of alienation of the inhabitants of this country appears to me frightening. If psychiatry is the medical technique that aims to enable the human being no longer to be a stranger to their environment, I owe it to myself to affirm that the Arab, permanently an alien in their own country, lives in a stage of absolute depersonalization. What is the status of Algeria? A systematized dehumanization. It was an absurd gamble to undertake at whatever cost to bring into existence a certain number of values when the lawlessness, the inequality, the multi-daily murder of human beings were raised to the status of legislative principles. The social structure existing in Algeria was hostile to any attempt to put the individual what where he belonged. Therefore, you know, an individual approach, psycho psychological approach was not going to be enough, basically, that's the point. I jump a few paragraphs and he writes, the function of a social structure is to set up institutions to serve the needs of human beings. A society that drives its members to desperate solution is a non-viable society, a society to be replaced. And then he concludes the resignation letter for many months my conscience has been the seat of unpardonable debates. And their conclusion is the determination not to despair of human beings, in other words, of myself. The decision I have reached is that I cannot continue to bear the responsibility at no matter what cost, on the false pretext that there is nothing else to be done. For all these reasons, I have the honor, Monsieur le Ministre, to ask you to be good enough to accept my resignation and to put an end to my mission in Algeria. And I think that one possible exercise for a future school is maybe having a workshop where everyone has to write a letter of resignation to the field of their choice, of their, that they feel most identified and that they love most. What would it be to, to resign that that you love most? For what? On the basis of one principle. What we present, and try to cut it short now, uh, what we present in the article is that clearly Fanon here, we think that Fanon is being consistent with his commitment to healing. 
he just realized that studying individual subjects is not the adequate you know, method approach to solve the situation, that he had to do it in a different way. Theoretically, he had already made the shifts from what he called ontogeny and phylogeny to sociogeny. So that shift he had already made theoretical. Here we see a translation at the, let's say, uh, professional level, if you will, existential level, more than that, uh, um, let's say, practical level, right? At least to some extent. So if he had, if you are a doctor, right, when you are a, a medical doctor, usually you are, you are expected to adhere to what is called the Hippocratic Oath. The Hippocratic Oath. And I'll give you a few lines of a modern version of the Hippocratic Oath, right? Which is this oath that doctors make that they are committing to, right? To heal no matter, you know, even if the person that you're trying to heal, you know, it may be Hitler, it may be someone eh, that you are committed to heal that person, right? That's at least more or less the idea. And these are some lines. I swear to fulfill to the best of my ability and judgment this covenant, a covenant. I will respect the hard wind scientific gains of those physicians in whose steps I walk. I will apply for the benefit of the sick all measures that are required. I will remember that there is art to medicine as well as sign. I will not be ashamed to say I, know, I do not know. I will respect the privacy of my patients for the problems are not disclosed to me that the world may know. But most especially must I tread with care in matters of life and death. But all of it within the exercise the, within the province of the exercise of the doctor or clinician also as an individual person treating an individual person. But what if the social structure itself is creating the sickness? And what uh, if there are others also combating against the sickness in that structure? What should the healer do? And Fanon clearly, clearly what he did was that he joined the revolutionary struggle. So what we uh, offer in the in the paper is that Fanon clearly in this resignation letter was demonstrating a also resignation not only from his position, you know, in as director, but resignation renouncing from the system of liberal medicine and the Hippocratic Oath. And that there are lines in Fanon's work that indicate what we, more than 60 years later, maybe we can sort of present as a Fanonian oath maybe as a kind of a decolonial version of a covenant for those who are committed to healing. And this covenant appears clearly in a number of you know, passages in Fanon's work. And let me tell you, and with this I finish just a few lines about what we say in the paper, what that this Fanonian oath for healing will be. And it will conclude with a, a quote from Fanon, where I think it summarizes this healing, right? If we're going to say, I swear this oath, right? So this is a few lines from the paper. A decolonial and Fanonian oath for healing would be one that calls attention to the role of alterity and sociality in the making of human reality, and that seeks to restore the basic coordinates that make up a human world, to restore the fundamental instability of the human and the open forms of interrelations and interconnections among humans that make this possible. This oath would also be a call for self-transformation, for the creation of community, for collective action, and for political reparations. We also say that as Fanon iterated, the work of an analysis to facilitate processes of conscientization so that black subjects may move toward this alienated resistance, um, abandon their attempts at hallucinatory whitening, and act, quoting Fanon, in the direction of a change in the social structure. This, uh, we say, cannot be done from outside of struggles for liberation, since the analysts themselves have to go through processes of disalienation and decolonization that do not full, fully take place within the formal spaces of their schooling, training, or professional practice. And I'd like to underscore that since the analysts themselves have to go through processes of disalienation, and decolonization that do not fully take place within the formal spaces of their schooling, training, or professional practice. Analysts whose practice is directed by what we are referring to here at the Fanonian Oath cannot remain in their privileged position of analysts. They have to be at the service of communities in movement, refine their views, learn new tasks, and in the process shed, this was quoted also yesterday from Fanon, all that calculating, all those strange silences, those ulterior motives, 
that divide your thinking and secrecy as they, the intellectuals, gradually plunge deeper among the people. And this is the line that I think, uh, one of the lines in which very directly from Fanon, I think, and this is a line, also an epigraph from Black Skin White Masks, and also taking from MSSR, this Afro or the Afro Caribbean uh, major intellectual. This is a quote from one of his fictional books, and Fanon takes it as a as an epigraph in the more psychotherapeutic text and psychopathology, the text on the chapter on psychopathology. Meaning it's almost as if this is the credo, the, the oath that I'm following when I'm writing critically about this psychopathology, and it reads like this. There is not in the world one single poor lynched bastard, one poor tortured man, human being, in whom I am not also murdered and humiliated. And I pass it to Shanas. Nelson. So, um, is this on? Yes. All right. Um, given where uh, Mohammed and I are coming from, we were obviously very excited about notions of rapture, um, combativity, um, thinking about how we can we can contribute to the thinking and the work on on psychoanalysis, and then again problematizing it um, in ways that talk to some of what Nelson has said already, but that is animated through work that we're doing on the ground. Um, and I keep coming back to this, how it is that we can mobilize this work to, to rethink um, the constructs, theories, conceptualizations in which we have been schooled, certainly Mohammed and I. Um, so I'll, I'll draw from, just by way of transition, pick up on what you were saying, Nelson, about um, working in the academy. I think probably Mohammed has, has written his resignation letter a long time ago. <laughs> um, but what we have resolved uh, and we do in our work is working with the academy and against the academy um, in ways that help privilege um, and underline our commitment to the kinds of things we have been all talking about since um, since yesterday. And maybe at the that while the entry into this work was through an invited publication to a special issue, and the special issue uh, placed us in dialogue with uh, Fanonian and Sudden Thought. And I'll, and I'll tell you that the special issue was titled Fanon, Sudden Theory and Psychoanalysis, Dialogues on Race, Gender and, and Sexuality. And this paper particularly, uh, specifically, was also co-authored, let us acknowledge, um, Copano Ratele, a former colleague um, at the Institute for Social and Health Sciences and chair of uh, France Fanon Foundation, Mireille France Fanon. Fanon thank you. Um, so, so the idea is the invitation was for us to render an insurgent reading uh, or rereading of the a practice of psychoanalysis. But for us, what it did was that it provided a platform in very real ways, in very engaged ways, actually, to continue to build on our, uh, on our mutual interests. And broadly speaking, this was on thinking about the wounds of the modern colonial world to which comrades here have spoken in very powerfully since yesterday um, and in different ways. And our jumping off point, as Nelson has already articulated, I think quite well, is that healing in, a, in an anti-Black modern colonial world is necessarily connected to revolutionary impulses. Whatever they are, revolutionary impulses that transcend this clinic. The psychoanalytic clinic is one of that, that um, pathologizes individuals, doesn't look at social pathology. It's one that generalizes, it's one that universalizes uh, subjectivity in the most problematic ways. And so it's transcending this clinic towards uh, processes or praxis, as we talked about this morning, that not only politicize social suffering 
um, and healing. And, and again, this came out very, very powerfully today, but also to go beyond the disciplinary and institutional frames that Nelson talked about. And certainly for Mohammed and me, this is very true, that conventionally tell us what social suffering and healing is, what it is not, or what it is what it should be. And so very much in line with, with what, what Fanon was saying and doing and writing about and talking about, this is really about pursuing praxis um, that rupture, that rupture towards alternative ways of our thinking, of thinking about psychologies and soci socialities. Yeah. Um, so inspired by uh, Comrade Nelson's work and based on our own community engaged and participatory action research, we focused in this paper on an Azanian uh, embodiment. And really it was a kind of opening for us to thinking about and engaging with situated enactments and possibilities towards the decolonial and Fanonian oath. Of course, this, this, this is a, a very much evolving, but to say that this articulation for us um, derives from the intersections of our work um, across the, at the intersections of the psychological, the political, and the ethical to consider how the work of healing in the context of system, the systematic wounding of Black life and all the trauma that accompanies it must um, necessarily be located within the lived experience of being black in an anti-black world, which of course Vico talks about very powerfully as does the black intellectual and psychologist uh, Chabani Mangani, who's, wrote, who's written about being black in the world. So this work then has its origins for us, Mohammed and I that is, um, in decolonial inflect, inflected community, African, um, and liberatory psychologies, um, though by design, it also exceeds this discipl these disciplinary parameters. Um, and it invites for us a rethinking um, that privileges local communities of healing practice. This is what we've tried to think about more carefully. And in this, of course, we find a great deal of inspiration and stimulus in black consciousness philosophy, right? Um, that locates modes of being, that locates um, uh, subjectivities and therefore the possibilities of uh, radical forms of healing very squarely, very explicitly within the context of the colonial violence on psychic life. You were talking about that when you facilitated the, the, the round table earlier and I suggested to Zandi that she might be a closet psychologist and she shut me down. <laughs> um, so our illustration then orients towards, it's an attempt to animate the provisions for a Fanonial uh, and decolonial oath of healing, right? Um, and, and we suggest, and I'll say a little bit about this in a moment, that decolonial love is a key premise of this. Mohammed's and my work, a uh, little bit about that, and that, of course, of our colleagues at the Institute for Social and Health Sciences, um, is the transdisciplinary, largely a transdisciplinary community engaged effort that locates healing within the pursuit, the triple pursuit of psychosocial, epistemic and material justice. Our program is facilitated by largely uh, participatory methodologies, um, psychosocial, technosocial platforms, gender-based appli gender applications, um, community training and so forth. I, I, I won't go into too much into that yet, but just to say that our collaboration with um, specifically the community of Tembelife, uh, the documentary you saw, spans over three decades. And of course this work is dynamic, um, but it has uh, been a very valuable, uh, a very valuable um, relationship by way of co-constructing and by way of co co-action around a suite of practices, around a suite of interventions that are increasingly alert to the decolonial options that make for healing and healing praxis, sorry, in the context of the history, the lived realities of 
under race, under gender, under class oppression, everyday lives and the everyday sites of struggle, but equally hope that are intrinsic to black suffering and to and to black um, uh, to alienation. Yeah, that that Nelson talked about. So this work is then concerned in many ways with how the unreckoned past of Azania continues to structure in the present, the um, psychological, the psychical, psychological, the material, um, and the ep epistemic in ways that are both visible and, and also un uh, invisible. So I think, Mohammed, at this point, you want to say a little bit about, a little more, by way of elaborating on what we do, and then I will step back into the dance to talk about the oath. Uh, thank you. So, you know, I, I feel a bit uh, dislocated. I just came in before lunch while people were having lunch. I, I don't have the benefit of the conversation that has uh, taken place over the day and a half. But I was very pleased to see Daphne. Uh, Daphne and I met in 1986 in an event that was organized by, uh, uh, facilitated by two psychologists. Um, and we were one of 40, we were two of 40 South Africans in 1986, uh, December sitting at the campus of University of Wits, trying to figure and getting to some dialogue about uh, what do we do living in the time of fire, the time of burning, it is a time when the state had been declared uh, not long ago, uh, prior to that event. And uh, that event was meant to be a, a deeply psychological healing moment, yeah? Uh, and now 35 years later, we're talking about the same things. We, 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 we are asking the same questions. We're grappling with the new forms of oppression, new forms of uh, dislocation. And I guess the institute that uh, Shenaz and I work in is really about, uh, at some level, finding a way to be present, to be present in this ongoing persistent uh, struggle, yeah? And the different forms of oppression and dislocation and dismemberment that one experiences. So, I'm not so sure what I'm going to say in the next few minutes. I know I'm supposed to say something, but I perhaps just want to focus on three things and then return to Shinaz. This, this institute that we work in was formed in 1985-86. And my first assignment was to work in, in the Soweto primary healthcare system. At that time, there were 12 clinics uh, dispersed all around Soweto. Uh, Jabavu, Chowelo, uh, Orlando, Deep Kloof, uh, and a whole range of others, Meadowlands, uh, Zola. And my task was to go to each clinic and train the primary health care nurses on the psycho uh, psychological dimensions of health. Uh, and if one understood how the health system worked and continues to work, uh, medical people and, and the healthcare workers were trained to see a diseased body. When, when a person walked in, they were, they were diseased, right? And it was uh, the language used was uh, used to, to diagnose disease, not the person, not to engage with the human being not to engage with the person's life world, but merely to find a diagnosis and hopefully send people away with some medication. Yeah? So the work we were trying to do is introduce, we were trying to introduce an emotional and psychological dimension to the health context. And 
very quickly we find ourselves in trouble with the health establishment. And within six months of our work, they expelled us. They said there was no space to entertain emotions and to, to be basically regarding the person, that there's no space in giving people an opportunity to talk about their life when they came in to a clinic, that the, the nursing staff, the primary health care and the medical doctors were trained to do rapid uh, diagnosis, uh, diagnostic interviews. They needed to get out a person in no more than five minutes person had to leave their, their, their consulting room and be moved on. And so the, the authorities expelled us and they said we were basically disrupting the system. And so we started thinking about what is the psychology we were trained for? Because there's a whole lot of power dynamics here and it, there was a uh, the psychology we got trained in was not talking to the context. Yeah? It was not talking to the context of suffering. It was not talking to the context of oppression and how people uh, presenting at a health clinic were actually asking for a different kind of help. They were not seeking a medical assistant. They were seeking assistance for suffering for social suffering, yeah? So I remember um, a woman would come into the consulting room where we worked every Monday after her first session with us, you know, we got acquainted, she gave us her name, etc. but she would come in every Monday and sit quietly for, a, for an hour and not say anything. She just came in for an hour and we would sit for that hour in silence. But she came back every week, every Monday, right? And I was just an intern. <laughs> I thought, what am I doing here? But she came back. When I think back about it, 35 years, that's what she needed. She needed a space to be silent, given the turmoil, <laughs> given the the, the battles that were raging in the streets, she just needed to be in a space, to be quiet. Yeah? What would one call that? What would you label it? Psychotherapy? <laughs> what would you call it? And this is what this institute is about. It's trying to find the words, the articulation for the dynamic work that has occurred over the last 35 years. Trying to make sense of it the, the, the terrain shifts, but the oppression persists. Yeah? Uh, the rulers change, the texture of the rulers change, but the oppression persists. We hear, we hear a new language of neoliberalism, we hear all kinds of things. And just in this last two weeks, in this last week, we are shocked by what's ha happening in our country. We are totally shocked. Why should we be shocked when we think about what has happened since 1994? The fundamental condition has not changed. Yeah? And the fundamental way in which we are educating our young people in our universities, in our schools, we are reproducing a script for dislocation, for dismemberment. And this institute is trying, has tried, through various means to be present, training young people to be present. When you're going to a community, how are you present? And how do you see people? What do you see? Are you seeing disease? Are you seeing pathology? Or are you seeing a human being with the full complexity trying to do something? And how do you join with that person or with that group? How does one join? This is what this paper is about, that Nelson and Shinaz is talking about. How does one make a connection when connections have been disrupted for more than 500 years? How does one reconnect as a, as a worker with your own humanity, 
and then extend that humanity as you are becoming human yourself with others who are struggling to also find that connection with themselves and, and the material world. Yeah? So I think I will stop there, Shanas. Thanks, Mohammed. Um, how much time do we have, Oms? <laughs> We've gone over time. Are you willing to give us some time? <laughs> All right, we'll speed it up. I guess, given what Mohammed has said, it just underlines again the urgency and the imperative to subscribe not to the Hippocratic, Hippocratic, crapic. Hippocratic, we shall call it Hippocratic oath <laughs> that Nelson talked about. Um, but to really think about healing work in a very, very different way. So what I quickly want to go through is the evolving element, elements. I want to stress evolving elements of our thinking and our striving towards vitalizing, animating this oath. And this has been co-assembled uh, with our community partners, yeah? And it configures for now around four primary coordinates, let's call them that. Um, I will name them, they sound a bit academic, but it's everything everyone has talked about. So epistemic agency, political affectivity, I'll explain, actional consciousness and radical relationality. And we're saying these four things for us are beginning to emerge as key markers of of uh, an elaboration of the oath that um, Nelson talked about. So the epistemological wound of coloniality is very much written into psychological theory, very much written into the theory of healing and supported by these theories. And it ultimately, what this does is that reproduces the forms of injury that produce black people as as the other of human in the first place, right? And this is the theory, these are the theories in which Muhammad and I have been schooled. This is, of course, um, very true then. Um, of, I'm, I'm saying psychology, but probably many other what we call side disciplines or helping disciplines. And here I want to quote from Lewis Gordon, who refers to this idea of an organized, he talks about an organized reality ignoring epistemic praxis, uh, practices, right? Which the opposite of which recognizes us as knowing subjects in healing work, in healing praxis, and as responsible, sorry, responsive to what we see as the facets of reality. So not reality ignoring. Uh, and to illustrate this, we want to turn very quickly to articulations from a collaborative intervention that, um, that form part of the uh, community storylines project that I talked about. Um, so in a story that was shared and digitally produced by a group of community leaders, the storytellers um, recount their everyday struggles, uh, everyday injuries. They talk about them as struggles, hardships, and suffering, their desires as we want to be heard. Um, they articulate the psychological wounding of their oppression as the sorrow of their community. And they say this, lost hopes, our voices go unheard, no water, no electricity, inadequate access to education, crime, violence, and poverty, being black and poor still stand in the way of our liberation. And similarly, another narrator references uh, suffering against conditions of unemployment, condition of poverty, condition of mental slavery. Was I taught this in my psychology training, even at a postgraduate level? We were not. And so, again, just underlining the kind of ruptures that need to happen. Boaventura de Sosa Santos says that the expression of these kinds of lived realities function as knowledge, as intervention, in reality, as opposed to merely representation of reality. And I think that's quite an important point here. So political affectivity, on the other hand, refers to the realms and the effects circulate 
and interchange between individuals and between collectives and communities, connecting them in a what is maybe thought about as a um, politicized multiplicity. And if you think about what happened here since yesterday, if you think what happened at the previous uh, schools, then this is it, right? Political affectivity. So it's simply it is to politicize affect and to connect affect to the political and to the ethical features of lived realities. Um, from a from a decolonial vantage point specifically, it exposes what Nelson talks about as the underside of the modern colonial um, wound. Coming back to the story, the digital story that I talked about, the story makers evoke political affectivity by saying this, not even apartheid could break our spirit and our determination to exist driven by the injustices, strengthened by a will to survive, ignited by the desire to recreate hope, striving towards transformation, united in our commitment and responsibilities, we fight on, we fight on for a better life. And so, you know, in talking about the denigration of blackness and black life, the storytellers mobilize these political affective resources and several of them. I won't go into them at this point. Radical hope being one of them, which, you know, Nelson, is something you, you say often, which is radical hope has to be seen in context. It's not to take away from the, from the conditions um, and the degrees of humanness or non-humanness that, um, that, that in which people's lives are are nonetheless located. So I won't go into that so much at this point, but I want to point out to perhaps one other point that emerged very strongly in talking about psychoaffectivity um, with, with our community partners. And here it's always about the reach for humanizing and the reach for human humaning. Humaning is a concept that was introduced by uh, Zimitri Erasmus, who is a sociologist at Wits University. And she defines it as a process of life in the making with others, life in the making of others, humaning. And that this has to be historically located and it has to be con contextually located as a praxis. Um, and then there's actual consciousness, which is really about critical forms of consciousness. Um, that give way to the articulation of social pathology, like I was saying earlier, which is very different from, from, an indi from individualizing pathology. And by propelling the combative work, by propelling activist struggle against, um, against the, the oppressions that we have been talking about. Nelson, you talk very much about, the, about this within the context of the decolonial attitude um, and this collective act of imagining, of inventing and acting um, that is so, so critical to actional, um, actional consciousness, um, which is to marshal, and it is to marshal racialized, gendered and classed alienations as a field. We did it, we did it today. Uh, as a field of retrieval, as a field of relationality, of resistance, of rebellion, of revolution, uh, and there's healing. There's healing. It is that talks to healing praxis um, in ways again that are not always visible. Um, perhaps one more quote. Perhaps one more quote. No, actually, the quote appeared in the documentary, so I'll skip that. Um, I will move on to almost almost there. Move on to radical relationality. I guess it's to say the obvious, right? It's about the being with. It's about being with. And for Biko, the interrelationship and inter -solid and solidarity um, is seen as a very fundamental to the very condition of possibility for being in the world. It's at the heart of the humaning we talk about in this paper is at the heart of relational accountability to which the decolonial and Fanonian oath talks. And so we, we conclude in the paper, certainly, we conclude by suggesting that this oath is really a methodology of decolonial love in many ways. Um, 
Fanon's declara declaration that today I believe in the possibility of love, and I don't think that's a complete quote, but today I believe in the possibility of love, urges a kind of commitment to creating alternatives, the alternatives we're talking about here uh, at the school that are founded certainly for us in our work that are founded in the psychopolitics and the ethical politics of liberation, yeah? Um, I quite like, I, I, I don't think I need to say more about uh, decolonial love, but to round off and pass it on to you, uh, uh, Nelson, I quite like, um, you know, where we take this in the paper in, in talking about and referencing again, Lewis Gordon, um, who talks about this, that the search, it's not only to search the question of liberation from, it's not only about liberation from, but critically it is to probe the question of liberation for. And you, um, Nelson, had added that this is quite central to Catherine Walsh's work, um, uh, which, she, which she formulates as the decolonial for, is, that's correct, the decolonial for. And so the imperatives of the decolonial for continues in our own work, in the collaborations with the community of Tembelithe and our collaborations with Comrade Nelson and other communities of decolonial practice. Um, and we, we're very excited about this work and hope to develop it more. And uh, just listening to the, especially the storytelling today um, was very inspiring in, in kind of formulating, um, form, formulating some more around these initial ideas that we've presented. So I'm going to stop and I'm going to hand over. Thank you, Shanas. And I, I won't really add anything else. I think we have probably say, say, said enough and, and there is time considerations, but I just wanted to note that I have received a call from a colleague about the urgency of uh, the Maasai people uh, in Tanzania. The Tanzania military and the police have been taking over the lands and their intent is to push them. Apparently, you know, there have been a bit by it. Um, the government of the United the United Arab Emirates, the royal family, to use the land for game hunting as a game hunting reserve, pushing the Maasai people from those lands. And they are calling three other origin issues that are killing people right now. I have a five, six minutes video that summarizes the situation, but uh, is it fine to put it now? Can we do it? Okay, I have it set up. And since we're talking about communities, right, in uh, uh, settling in spaces and in, in extreme vulnerable situation, we thought that it speaks to what we're talking to. So the... And the volume? Is it here? Please help me with the volume. Let's see, it's here, all of it. Where? Here? Okay. okay, no? It's up to that. Okay, that's it. On the outskirts of the Serengeti National Park, the UNESCO World Heritage Site, they've been demonstrating against a government exercise to mark up ancestral grazing lands to create a private hunting reserve. Activists say it does. Some of the protesters were shot and wounded. The people believe what the land belongs to them, and the government is saying that the land is the government's land. So I think it's really where the problem is. And uh, I think that it, it, it was to be, there are many clear procedures in the laws of Tanzania on how to. How to protect the land from uh, the whole change the categories of land from the green land to reserve uh, land. But uh, the issue is the whole procedures are not being followed. Up to 200,000 people live in the Serengeti area, generating millions of dollars in income. That's increased competition for land on the edge of the national park. Thousands of Maasai families were forced to leave their villages in 2009. So that's an Emirati company organized hunting trips to the window. 
that deal was cancelled eight years later after allegations of corruption. The government says human activity is putting pressure on wildlife in the Serengeti National Park. It denies trying to evade Maasai and says it's offered to recover the communities away from their historic homeland. At the Maasai say the land belongs to them and isn't a spell for elite tourism. Yeah, it can be your is a Maasai even goes now from my way. We do tell you that it's on the program, sir. Let's just clarify first, if, if you can tell us, uh, have any Maasai warriors in or community members been hurt or injured in this government operation? Thank you very much. Um, that is indeed the fact. Um, over 30 um, young men and old men as well have been injured in this operation. And many are being taken to nearby hospitals and they are receiving treatment right now. Some have very uh, serious injuries and broken legs, broken knees, and torn muscles because of uh, bullets. And so many have uh, certain very, very serious injuries. Okay, so the government um, operation. The government operation happened on an area of land that we have been reporting on. Can you confirm to us who actually owns the land or who is legally allowed to live on that land or use that land? By law, and by law, I mean land law, and um, uh, local government law, uh, all of them that uh, land belongs to the villages. And villages means um, locally established um, villages um, where people live. The so uh, the right to work as a land are in the very communities. So tell us what sort of conversation have the Maasai had with the government over taking over this land? Has there ever been a conversation? about the government taking this land back? The government um, has for a long time wanted to take uh, this land for the claims of conservation. And in a way, they were making this decision um, for a long time ago. Um, the community has always been saying, we have no subject or uh, at the stage as much. And um, so that there's not been a, a really open dialogue between the community and the government. Only quite recently, in 2016, 2018, the government actually asked the people to present an opinion on how conservation could be done. And the, the community actually presented the opinion to the government, to the development community. And also uh, this year, about two weeks ago, the community presented a proposal to the government on how this can be solved. The conflict, conservation, and community evidence can be all accommodated. And the government has not given any feedback to uh, until when we are seeing this operation. How do you think that? How do you think, sir, that it's going to be resolved if you're saying that? The community has offered suggestions and solutions, and uh, the government itself has not come back to you uh, in any form of conversation or in written word. How do you see this actually being resolved? Um, one, the government must uh, actually take into account and consider very highly the community recommendations. And uh, for now, the government has stopped this operation, which is going on in the jungle, and must simply open um, a dialogue on how to do it in the zone. But generally, the community needs this land. They have already given away uh, in 1959 for conservation, and now they need this land for their own protection. And uh, the only way a proposition can be done is by actually asking the people how they should do it jointly. 
So one thing, the government must see this operation and they must open the uh, dialogue uh, more broadly, but also they should understand that the community really needs this land for their own survival. I'll leave it there. I think that this speaks also to the Pan African dimensions of our interest and discourses. So, uh, and of course, the centrality of land for the entire continent to different peoples living in it in Mother Africa. Thank you. Yeah, Mohammed. Good. Okay. So, Madam Moderator. Hey, um, thank you so much, everyone. Um, I'm going to invite Uzawadi uh, Nosindiswa, and I'm going to briefly just say how I know you guys. Um, we are in the business of performance art. So when I actually came back from Cape Town, or wherever my travels are, right? I'm coming back, I meet to Sindiswa, I'm looking for poetry, and they're organizing as young people. So I've watched her perform in a hotel. I'm like, Do you ever, how did I get like, and they make people pay, right? For poetry. It's like, it's, I think it's revolutionary. Like to make people pay for poetry. And, and it's like 200 and 100. And that means people are getting, um, artists are being paid also. I've met her, I met her since so I perform at the Playhouse Company. I'm, I, I, Cause I've been observing, this is what happens. I really enjoy the life. And, and then you build community from that, seeing people practice. Ozawadi I've met, um, in a storytelling festival. Yadrinam Shope is an oral storyteller. See the connections and the relations. And all I've been doing is just observing. Um, I know they'll talk about what they do, but what I've been doing is being a participant observer in the community. So, and they play an indigenous instrument called Makwean.
I was carrying uh, Umapayana, that instrument. Oh, that, that Umapayana is mine, but it's not tuned. That is mine. Um, I was carrying Umapayana uh, around my neighborhood where I actually grew up and I became a celebrity. Uh, <laughs> people, people who know me from, from birth. And uh, when I'm following me around, I think, what is this? Hey, you so control when I, nah, nah. And um, I, I can't say I didn't like that. <laughs> because, you know, yeah, I love attention. <laughs> yeah. Um, which, which brought me to, to this thought, um, Uti, these things um, look, um, more like they are stylish now, but they are not. These things are ours. These things should be normal. Uh, uh, is a bow instrument. Uh, it's an indigenous instrument. And um, in the family of bow instruments, there are many uh, instruments, for an example, in this course, we have Uadi, we have Umakoyana, and this is Zulu. We have in other countries, it is called Terimbao. Uh, uh, but we, we also have um, different elements, uh, for an example, the shape and 
sound sometimes. I will not go deep into that. Um, what is important though is what um, what instilled the love of of wanting to actually learn the instrument is, is the fact that we we, for, we forget ourselves uh, in the journey of trying to uh, inspire ourselves uh, and be better people in our communities. We want to get jobs. We want our families to be fed. So the world is so busy and we end up moving away from ourselves. And I had uh, this uh, thought in, in, instilled in me that I need something to meditate with. Initially, when I I, I had um, a wish of playing Uma Kweyana, it was not about um, using it for my performances, but for me, it was it was a, a thought that I need to, after coming from work or from wherever, I need to sit down, be with myself, play the instrument, maybe a few lines will come for my poetry, maybe other ideas of bettering myself will come, but be off social media and it will be off everything and just invite myself back to myself because honestly the way that um, the world is so busy we we end up having so many things outside and and those things honestly are stressing us and um i really found a friend uh, in uma um there is ukoko a ukoko uba vihile uh, that one. Uh, um, she is on her 70s. I, I saw her playing Oma in an event, Dr. Donald Shope, the event is called Unosinoat. And I loved the instrument. I think in my life, before meeting Ukoko, I had. I had seen this lovely instrument by Naked Eye maybe one or two times in my whole life. Um, imagine that, uh, which means there are not so many people who, who, who have the instrument, who know how to play the instrument. Therefore, that means in my generation, so many people are not exposed to these indigenous instruments. And that is really sad because um, they are honestly who we are, and they carry our history. Uh, I, I strongly think, I strongly believe uh, that um, the art um, is not is not only for 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 us to take art as a career, but it is also for our own development our own um our own story of history because um we know that if our history is not uh, encrypted in our own way of doing of doing things then someone else will definitely tell our history not the way that it, it, it truly is um, so, I, I, I love Uma Kweane a lot. U, Uzawadi is a friend of mine because Ukokuba Vigile, Ukokuba Vigile um, is, 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 is the person who made this instrument that we are carrying by hand. She has no funding, but she is so in love with um, teaching young um, children how to play Uma Kweyana in a sense that when I called her, um, I think it was yesterday, I said, Coco, I'm going to talk AUKZN, so I can't use your pictures without <laughs> your permission. And Coco was like, yeah, when? 
And when are you coming here? I want to teach you. She is not interested in these um, things that I'm doing. She wants to see. That means she is burning with, 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 with passion. She wants to teach this beautiful instrument. But um, because of lack of help sometimes, uh, it is not easy because she's, she doesn't have funding and, and, and and what this teaches me is that um, we as um, young people should try and be close um, to people who can teach us, who can give us the values that we need in life. I was, I was listening to someone actually speaking about, uh, I think it's a, it's a story from the Bible. And this person was saying, um when all oh, Moses um were going out of Egypt, they actually took bones of their ancestors with them. In this journey of our decoloniality, uh, we should not leave our instruments, we should not leave our songs, and uh, the 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 way that we should um, do that is to be close to older people uh, who know these things, who do not read these things on Google, who know these things. <laughs> you, know, you know, when you are told to talk about something, Google one day, ah, okay, sure. These people know these things. They know how to build these things. And it's, I think it's her, and Umam Lu that um, I know who play Umakwean, which means that um, we, we do not have many people and she's on her seventies. You know, we do not have many people who know those things, who are prepared to teach us more about these things. So the, the whenever the platform avails, whenever the chance avails itself, we should close the gap between generations by getting close to these people. And also it is a challenge for us as well to go out there and teach other people. The song that Uzawati uh, opened with is Pigeleli. It is a love song. It was written by um, Princess Makoko, mother of <laughs> mother of Prince uh, Mangosutu Butelezi. Um, you know how, how nice is, is it um, that we we have these things where we express ourselves using song. And I remember this um, funny, funny story that Uzawati, because, because Uzawati teaches me, she's a friend of mine, she teaches me Umakwana, but it's not formal because we are friends. Whenever, even on video call, hey, oh, I have this and it's nice like that. So this other time Uzawati was saying, Umakwana has this element of sarcasm because Oneni um, in the olden days would actually address an employer uh, pretending like they're singing a lullaby. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't know of any song, but I'll just, I'll just make an example. If, if Uneni has a problem, this mother is evil, is lazy. Then she would then create a song about la 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 la. She's pretending like she's saying la la gan, you know, uh, sleep or child, uzalwa evil, you know, but it's a song. <laughs> it's a song, you know. So all these things um, carry, carry history. And sometimes it has this element of, of being funny and, and all of these things. And honestly, we need um, to always be in touch I became a celebrity that day on the streets, but honestly, I should not have <laughs> became a celebrity. I should not have enjoyed being a celebrity. I should have been worried. 
that children from my community do not know what I am carrying. And I should have thought of many, thi many things that I could do for them to be exposed, even though I'm not yet a pro, but the little knowledge that I have should be given to them as well. So, so that all of us in Love and Bill may be celebrities. Thank you. <laughs> Uzawati, we, we will give us um, a, a brief explanation of the instrument and give us the sound, and then we will do a collaboration of song and poetry. Thank you. Um, I, I call it an intimate friend. And this instrument, um, I learned to play the instrument after getting the music. And for the next generation as well. Um, uh, Princess Makoko plays this instrument so beautifully, but um, I think when she's playing, the enhancement of the, the, the instrument is her voice. Well, um, I'm privileged as well because I have a voice. So well, I, when I thought to myself, well, then uh, maybe I can do something. Uh, and then also the way that she is playing, it's as uh, for me, it's basics. Uh, as I've just played the song, it only goes with these two notes, and then you just hit the notes. Ba 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 ha 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 ha. It's so difficult to learn this and be able to sing. Yes, at the same time. But then I told myself, like every day, I was listening to her and listening to how she plays, when she turns. I, 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 I'm not even, I, I've never done music in school formally. Um, it's just talent and gift. So when I was learning this, and then I, I, I got inspired every day. And then, of course, I, I remember my first performance. I was in UNISA in Pretoria singing a, a song and also I was trying to um uh to 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 recite <laughs> some of because she also the beauty of her playing and singing these songs is the beauty of the narratives that she includes when she writes it's so deep and she is even able when she is playing she is she is able to recite maybe izibongo zamakosi unyatsile hambe sengamema zibule nje ngomzinga lamafeka nokuthebe izinto zokwana nda bobo diwa ngamanqatha See, and I, I was so attached with this. And then uh, after a few years uh, playing and performing, uh, I met Uma Bing. And then she added more skills on how can I advance the instrument? The instrument has only two notes. That's it. And then she told me to play with three and four of other notes that I've never thought about when I was playing or rehearsing. Because now, also, <laughs> also,
so and then i was like this is beautiful and it's i, I got more and more and more interested in, in in the instrument um this instrument is made of the fen tree this is a fen tree and then this is a curtain wire i think we all see the curtain wire because the wire is more strong than other wires so it's easy and you it, it's it's it makes the instrument to stay longer you know when whenever you're playing and this is a calabash uh we put the calabash and uh it takes about six months for a calabash to be ready for you to prepare and make the instrument the sounds comes from here. Yes, we play on the string, but the sounds come from the calabash. Uh, the beauty of African knowledge and, uh, and African people who were able to discover and make these instruments and be able to tell stories through these instruments. And even uh, because when, when I listen to the songs, basically the instrument was of, Oh, Princess Makoko used to sit with oh, 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 Prince oh, oh, Telezi because Prince Telezi was singing with him oh, with his mother most of the times. When we, when his mother was singing, you always hear him on the background. I'm like, he was taught well because he was taught in a family of music, in a family of culture and heritage and also um, art you know uh most most importantly so when she was playing she was telling the stories that were happening around whether it's love whether it's sad whether it's sorrow whatever that was happening she was able to narrate but through the instrument which we can all do we can all observe uh oh, oh, mama said she's an observer <laughs> she only knows it because she observes so we can all observe and create and be creative and tell our own stories and that can be preserved for our new generation uh new and new and new and all other generation so uh, i've just explained this instrument i think cindy so can join me so that we can play a song with a, 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 a poetry and then I will ask everyone to sing a song with us. I'll just teach you, it's a, it's a beautiful song, it's a short song. Well, I, I wrote this song um, about African beauty. When I was writing this song in my mind, I, I said, I want, <laughs> I want every woman to be confident about who they are when you are done working and doing everything go back home remove the makeup and look at yourself and love yourself embrace who you are
Ubumnyama ilona langa letu esilasiyo tunjwa na kamama. Abasiyo bati ubumnyama kabugase budalwe. Babu kona kwa sema parate. Po unga bupigi saka njani ubuyoni ngube sikalo. Ameto ako afika ikulu lesi konto engi genga siloba enze ibe inye. Utatewe nukabanga uto olu ngono kepanasi isi nkonto tatazona. Leli ikalami engi wamela lona kifumula. Kutalo buka mama obu mtope. Kisanga nisangawe unongindi. Sizugulwana siga sifepu gama pita. Ihumole sinombi galiga peleli unga rafidi. Kula ngelosi elitwala. Musasa. Nagulo nyara utatewe nugabu yanga na luto unga pande kwe shumi lesi ngondo. Kanye nolwa nde wezi nyembezi za bebe la lele. Sale se ukesa ngazo utulu. Luse lute olwa ko ukalo. Unga fumi babu kudule uikanyezi wena. Kanye kakulu ebu mnyame. Umuse. Unga ipili impilo ngova. Sisi, 
Okay, so we, there is tea and coffee, um, and then we move to the jazz, and we jazz it up, right? Because my sister. So the music also evokes uh, memories of histories. Um, people want to have conversations um so so, so hey hi i want to to you man yeah i want to tell you know because it's what
Nyambung sebut si ayah. Sebulan. Sebulan. Asyik yang ayah ni. Asyik bambel. Asyik bambel. Si songe ada wai school nagala. Asi bambe ni songe. Eye tu si songe ada wai school nagala. Chene galogo kasi bambe ni songe. Seni tanda seni wo mama. Eye tu si songe kusoba right. Chene galogo kasi bambe ni songe.
Right, South Africa, Sina Mesele, young South Africa, I guess in Bambeni, song South Africa, Sina Mesele, young South Africa, I see Bambeni, song South Africa, 
South Africa, Sinya Mezelele Yonke. South Africa, Asima Beni Sonke. South Africa, Sinya Mezelele Yonke. South Africa. Thank <laughs> you. 
We couldn't go for shekel less because it didn't sound appealing to the guys who book us sometimes. <laughs> so we are bandless because uh, we tried to free ourselves from the shackles that binded us from each, all kinds of aspects on our lives, mainly in the music because Ushubi and I, when we started uh, this, oh, by the way, may I introduce these gentlemen? I'm so sorry. Uh, Mr. Shubi Vagalisa Chele on the saxophone. Mr. Blessing Twala on the upright bass. Mr. Mjablele Nzuza on the drums. And uh, some fella called Spuda on the keys. Um, as I was saying, when Shubi and I started this, we were working in different uh, acts. He was in a different band, I was in a different band. And when we got together and talked about our experiences, it was obvious that we were not happy where we were because of certain shekels or certain boundaries that this is Tolelaga's corner. And uh, then Bandless was born. And Bandless, we kind of tried to lean more to the non-conventional because most of the bands that we've heard of and we've looked upon have had um have went through directions which we don't want to go through so we said why don't we not consider ourselves a band but more of a camaraderie of sorts so we share a, a brotherhood um which allows us to be free and allow us to express certain things to one another so we would, oh, the first song we started with was, uh, what did we start with? Oh, Asiban Bailey by Mubebi Tuaeli, a great, 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 great man of the jazz idiom whom we look up to and love so much. And we followed with, thank you. We followed with uh, another one by one of the greats, uh, by Wabu Winston Ngozi Mankunku. It was called Abantuana the African, Children of Africa. And uh, we'd like to, oh, oh, yes. And then we did an Andile Enana tune, which was the second tune, I'm sorry. The second tune was an Andile Enana tune called Wicked Whispers, and the third was a Heavy Soil. It's three songs already. Yeah. Feels like two. <laughs> okay, okay. Huh?
would like to continue with uh, an original he wrote for Babundi uh, Kokaba. Bundi Kokaba was exiled and he was part of the ANC. I was lucky to meet him and know more about things that went behind the curtains and all the inequalities and all the things that squeeze into the eye as much as uh, it, it is shown to us on television. So Obabindi Kokaba, when he was in exile, he was um, one of the people who were taking care of the, and raising and grooming the students who were also exiled during 1976 after the riots. So students, I figure like Obabindi Kokaba, and I've been fortunate to hear about wonderful and very painful stories as well uh, from Yenu Babundi Kokaba. He made his transition on 2019. And um, before I even studied music, he was someone who being Kombisa, uh, certain things about music while like Kaya and brought me very near and draw my attention to Umkulo Walaikaya because I was mostly interested into uh, American music because obviously we are all raised by American television. <laughs> so this one is called Homa. And Homa, I am told by Ubabundiko, is a style of, uh, so it's, a, it's a certain nuance in the South African jazz style, uh, hailing from Cape Town. Some people call it Guma, but other people call it Homa, Homalajis. So this is um, a rendition of his Homa, which we took, put a little bit of reharmonization and uh, put some lyrics into it. And it's called Homa for Brandico.
Some of our cool, some of our cool. Okay. Yes, yes. Uh, now, right? Okay. Uh, before that, uh, this is something we'd like to do for someone whose day is special today. It's their birthday. So, yes. Who's going to be
as BHK, Nabanto and Nabasalu Coach Alusa Manzi Afrocentric Academy, we have something special for you. They're not here today, but they are the reason why we have this item. In the spirit of decolonizing, we decolonized the Happy Birthday song and we created a new song for the kids for birthday and we want to share the song with you today because it's a special day. Um, so the song, uh, um, during lunchtime, Begashuguti, every moment and every experience has a soundtrack, right? And so we were in a round, in a, in a circle, we were teaching and one of the kids, very birthday, yeah, okay. And we thought about what can we do? And this song was playing in the background. Baba Abraham, um, Abraham, uh, Abdullah Abraham, Chisa. And then from there, we took the melody and we ran with it. So we are all going to sing the song, right? Yes. So it goes. Usugulo guswala luga mam tefni. Usugulo guswala luga mam tefni. Me guswala luga mam tefni. Usugulo guswala luga mam tefni. Me nam nandi mo Africa. Me nam nandi mo Africa. Minem nandi mo Africa, minem nandi Mo Africa, mini. Mo Africa, mini. Mina Nandi, Mo Africa. Mina Nandi, Mo Africa. O Sugulogu Sala, Luga Mante, me. Eh, O Sugulogu Sala, Luga. Eh. Mom Daphne, thank you so much for, you know, being part of a very important part into our lives. Because you dreamt, because you fought, because you refused to be put down, today we are here and we can speak black consciousness in, with so much joy and happiness and progress, right? So because you were part of that, you contributed. We thank you so much. And I was just thinking, 76, 
1976. There's something there, 76. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Everybody say yeah, 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 yeah. Ah. Toba fell away, oh, me lo malo. If your head is what, I'm what I go colon. Toba fell away, oh, me lo malo. If you want cook soup, I'm what I go colon. Toba baba daba o mirela If your child will grow Toba fesi be o mirela If your child will grow If what I kill your child, I what I go use Na 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 Toba fesi be o mirela I 
Talk of black man power. We not get enemy. I they talk of black power. I say, I say, we not get enemy. I say, what I no get enemy. Yeah, we not get enemy. I say, what I no get enemy. Yeah. Ah da 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 da. Ba 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 ba. Can you get a quick, quick picture with the band, comrades? Quick, quick, please, everyone. Jani, where Jani? Boy, 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 is what at this time? 